This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. www.kray.org. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book Two, Chapter Four. Congratulatory. From the dimly lighted passages of the court, the last sediment of the human stew that had been boiling there all day was straining off, when Dr. Manette, Lucy Manette, his daughter, Mr. Lorry, the solicitor for the defence, and its counsel, Mr. Stryver, stood gathered round Mr. Charles Darnay, just released, congratulating him on his escape from death. It would have been difficult by a far brighter light to recognize in Dr. Manette, intellectual of face and upright of bearing, the shoemaker of the garret in Paris. Yet no one could have looked at him twice without looking again, even though the opportunity of observation had not extended to the mournful cadence of his low grave voice, and to the abstraction that overclouded him fitfully, without any apparent reason. While one external cause, and that a reference to his long lingering agony, would always, as on the trial, evoke this condition from the depths of his soul, it was also in its nature to arise of itself, and to draw a gloom over him as incomprehensible to those unacquainted with his story, as if they had seen the shadow of the actual Bastille thrown upon him by a summer sun, when the substance was three hundred miles away. Only his daughter had the power of charming this black brooding from his mind. She was the golden thread that united him to a past beyond his misery, and to a present beyond his misery. And the sound of her voice, the light of her face, the touch of her hand, had a strong, beneficial influence with him almost always. Not absolutely always— for she could recall some occasions on which her power had failed, but they were few and slight, and she believed them over. Mr. Darnay had kissed her hand fervently and gratefully, and had turned to Mr. Stryver, whom he warmly thanked. Mr. Stryver, a man of little more than thirty, but looking twenty years older than he was, stout, loud, red, bluff, and free from any drawback of delicacy, had a pushing way of shouldering himself, morally and physically, into companies and conversations that argued well for his shouldering his way up in life. He still had his wig and gown on, and he said, squaring himself at his late client to that degree that he squeezed the innocent Mr. Lorry clean out of the group, I am glad to have brought you off with honour, Mr. Darnay. It was an infamous prosecution, grossly infamous, but not the less likely to succeed on that account. You have laid me under an obligation to you for life, in two senses, said his late client, taking his hand. I have done my best for you, Mr. Darnay, and my best is as good as another man's, I believe." It clearly being incumbent on some one to say, much better, Mr. Lorry said it, perhaps not quite disinterestedly, but with the interested object of squeezing himself back in again. "'You think so?' said Mr. Stryver. "'Well, you have been present all day, and you ought to know. You are a man of business, too, and as such—' quoth Mr. Lorry, whom the counsel learned in the law had now shouldered back into the group, just as he had previously shouldered him out of it, as such I will appeal to Dr. Manette, to break up this conference and order us all to our homes. Miss Lucy looks ill. Mr. Darnay has had a terrible day. We are worn out. "'Speak for yourself, Mr. Lorry,' said Stryver. "'I have a night's work to do yet. Speak for yourself.' "'I speak for myself,' answered Mr. Lorry, 
and for Mr. Darnay, and for Miss Lucy, and— "'Miss Lucy, do you not think I may speak for us all?' He asked her the question pointedly, and with a glance at her father. His face had become frozen, as it were, in a very curious look at Darnay, an intent look, deepening into a frown of dislike and distrust, not even unmixed with fear. With this strange expression on him his thoughts had wandered away. "'My father,' said Lucy, softly laying her hand on his. He slowly shook the shadow off and turned to her. "'Shall we go home, my father?' With a long breath he answered, "'Yes.' The friends of the acquitted prisoner had dispersed, under the impression, which he himself had originated, that he would not be released that night. The lights were nearly all extinguished in the passages, the iron gates were being closed with a jar and a rattle, and the dismal place was deserted until to-morrow morning's interest of gallows, pillory, whipping-post, and branding-iron should repeople it. Walking between her father and Mr. Darnay, Lucy Manette passed into the open air. A hackney-coach was called, and the father and daughter departed in it. Mr. Stryver had left them in the passages, to shoulder his way back to the robing-room. Another person, who had not joined the group, or interchanged a word with any one of them, but who had been leaning against the wall where its shadow was darkest, had silently strolled out after the rest, and had looked on until the coach drove away. He now stepped up to where Mr. Lorry and Mr. Darnay stood upon the pavement. "'So, Mr. Lorry, men of business may speak to Mr. Darnay now?' Nobody had made any acknowledgment of Mr. Carton's part in the day's proceedings. Nobody had known of it. He was unrobed, and was none the better for it in appearance. If you knew what a conflict goes on in the business mind, when the business mind is divided between good-natured impulse and business appearances, you would be amused, Mr. Darnay. Mr. Lorry reddened and said warmly, "'You have mentioned that before, sir. We men of business, who serve a house, are not our own masters. We have to think of the house more than ourselves.' "'I know, I know,' rejoined Mr. Carton, carelessly. "'Don't be nettled, Mr. Lorry. You are as good as another, I have no doubt. Better, I dare say.' "'And indeed, sir,' pursued Mr. Lorry, not minding him, "'I really don't know what you have to do with the matter. If you'll excuse me, as very much your elder, for saying so, I really don't know that it is your business.' "'Business? Bless you! I have no business,' said Mr. Carton. "'It is a pity you have not, sir.' "'I think so, too.' "'If you had,' pursued Mr. Lorry, "'perhaps you would attend to it.' "'Lord love you, no, I shouldn't,' said Mr. Carton. "'Well, sir,' cried Mr. Lorry, thoroughly heated by his indifference, "'Business is a very good thing, and a very respectable thing. "'And, sir, if business imposes its restraints, and its silences and impediments, "'Mr. Darnay, as a young gentleman of generosity, knows how to make allowance for that circumstance. "'Mr. Darnay, good night. God bless you, sir. "'I hope you have been this day preserved for a prosperous and happy life. "'Chair there.' Perhaps a little angry with himself, as well as with the barrister, Mr. Lorry bustled into the chair, and was carried off to Tellson's. Carton, who smelt of port wine, and did not appear to be quite sober, laughed then, and turned to Darnay. "'This is a strange chance that throws you and me together. This must be a strange night to you, standing alone here with your counterpart on these street-stones.' "'I hardly seem yet,' 
returned Charles Darnay, to belong to this world again. I don't wonder at it. It's not so long since you were pretty far advanced on your way to another. You speak faintly. I begin to think I am faint. Then why the devil don't you dine? I dined myself while those numbskulls were deliberating which world you should belong to, this or some other. Let me show you the nearest tavern to dine well at. Drawing his arm through his own, he took him down Ludgate Hill to Fleet Street, and so, up a covered way, into a tavern. Here they were shown into a little room, where Charles Darnay was soon recruiting his strength with a good plain dinner and good wine, while Carton sat opposite to him at the same table, with his separate bottle of port before him, and his fully half-insolent manner upon him. "'Do you feel, yet, that you belong to this terrestrial scheme again, Mr. Darnay?' "'I am frightfully confused regarding time and place, but I am so far mended as to feel that. "'It must be an immense satisfaction.' He said it bitterly, and filled up his glass again, which was a large one. "'As to me, the greatest desire I have is to forget that I belong to it. It has no good in it for me, except wine like this, nor I for it. So we are not much alike in that particular. Indeed, I begin to think we are not much alike in any particular, you and I.' Confused by the emotion of the day, and feeling his being there with this double of coarse deportment to be like a dream, Charles Darnay was at a loss how to answer. Finally, answered not at all. "'Now your dinner is done,' Carton presently said. "'Why don't you call a health, Mr. Darnay? Why don't you give your toast?' "'What health? What toast?' "'Why, it's on the tip of your tongue. It ought to be, it must be. I'll swear it's there.' "'Miss Manette, then. Miss Manette, then.' Looking his companion full in the face while he drank the toast, Carton flung his glass over his shoulder against the wall, where it shivered to pieces, then rang the bell and ordered in another. "'That's a fair young lady to hand to a coach in the dark, Mr. Darnay,' he said, ruing his new goblet. A slight frown and a laconic, yes, were the answer. That's a fair young lady to be pitied by and wept for by. How does it feel? Is it worth being tried for one's life, to be the object of such sympathy and compassion, Mr. Darnay? Again Darnay answered not a word. She was mightily pleased to have your message when I gave it her. Not that she showed she was pleased, but I suppose she was. The allusion served as a timely reminder to Darnay that this disagreeable companion had, of his own free will, assisted him in the strait of the day. He turned the dialogue to that point, and thanked him for it. "'I neither want any thanks nor merit any,' was the careless rejoinder. "'It was nothing to do, in the first place.' "'and I don't know why I did it in the second. "'Mr. Darnay, let me ask you a question.' "'Willingly, and a small return for your good offices. "'Do you think I particularly like you?' "'Really, Mr. Carton,' returned the other, oddly disconcerted, "'I have not asked myself the question. "'But ask yourself the question now.' "'You have acted as if you do, but I don't think you do.' "'I don't think I do,' said Carton. "'I begin to have a very good opinion of your understanding.' "'Nevertheless,' pursued Darnay, rising to ring the bell, "'there is nothing in that, I hope, to prevent my calling the reckoning, "'and our parting without ill blood on either side.' Carton rejoining, "'Nothing in life.' Darnay rang. "'Do you call the whole reckoning?' said Carton. 
on his answering in the affirmative. "'Then bring me another pint of this same wine-drawer, and come and wake me at ten. The bill being paid, Charles Darnay rose and wished him good-night. Without returning the wish, Carton rose too, with something of a threat of defiance in his manner, and said, "'A last word, Mr. Darnay. Do you think I am drunk?' "'I think you have been drinking, Mr. Carton.' "'Think? You know I have been drinking.' "'Since I must say so, I know it.' "'Then you shall likewise know why. I am a disappointed drudge, sir. I care for no man on earth, and no man on earth cares for me.' "'Much to be regretted. You might have used your talents better.' "'Maybe so, Mr. Darnay.' Maybe not. Don't let your sober face elate you, however. You don't know what it may come to. Good night. When he was left alone, this strange being took up a candle, went to a glass that hung against the wall, and surveyed himself minutely in it. "'Do you particularly like the man?' he muttered at his own image. "'Why should you particularly like a man who resembles you?' There is nothing in you to like, you know that. Ah, confound you! What a change you have made in yourself! A good reason for taking to a man, that he shows you what you have fallen away from, and what you might have been. Change places with him, and would you have been looked at by those blue eyes as he was, and commiserated by that agitated face as he was? Come on, and have it out in plain words. You hate the fellow! He resorted to his pint of wine for consolation, drank it all in a few minutes, and fell asleep on his arms, with his hair straggling over the table, and a long winding-sheet in the candle dripping down upon him. End of Book Two, Chapter Four Read by Kara Schallenberg On January 26th 2006, in Oceanside, California. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Chip in Tampa, Florida, on January 13, 2006. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens Book Two, Chapter Five The Jackal Those were drinking days, and most men drank hard. So very great is the improvement time has brought about in such habits that a moderate statement of the quantity of wine and punch which one man would swallow in the course of a night without any detriment to his reputation as a perfect gentleman would seem in these days a ridiculous exaggeration. The learned profession of the law was certainly not behind any other learned profession in its bacchanalian propensities. Neither was Mr. Stryver, already fast shouldering his way to a large and lucrative practice, behind his compeers in this particular, any more than in the drier parts of the legal race. A favorite at the Old Bailey, and eke at the Sessions, Mr. Stryver had begun cautiously to hew away at the lower staves of the ladder on which he mounted. Sessions and the Old Bailey had now to summon their favorite specially to their longing arms, and, shouldering itself toward the visage of the Lord Chief Justice in the Court of King's Bench, the florid countenance of Mr. Stryver might be daily seen, bursting out of a bed of wigs, like a great sunflower pushing its way at the sun from among a rank garden full of flaring companions. It had once been noted at the bar that while Mr. Stryver was a glib man and an unscrupulous and a ready and a bold that he had not that faculty of extracting the essence from a heap of statements, which is among the most striking and necessary of the advocate's accomplishments. But a remarkable improvement came upon him as to this. The more business he got, the greater his power seemed to grow of getting at the pith and marrow, and however late at night he sat carousing with Sidney Carton, 
he always had his points at his fingers' end in the morning. Sidney Carton, idlest and most unpromising of men, was Stryver's great ally. What the two drank together between Hillary Term and Michaelmas might have floated a king's ship. Stryver never had a case in his hand anywhere, but Carton was there with his hands in his pockets, staring at the ceiling of the court. They went to the same circuit, and even there they prolonged their usual orgies late into the night, and Carton was rumored to be seen at broad day going home stealthily and unsteadily to his lodgings like a dissipated cat. At last it began to get about, among such as were interested in the matter, that although Sidney Carton would never be a lion, he was an amazingly good jackal, and that he rendered suit and service to Stryver in that humble capacity. Ten o'clock, sir,' said the man at the tavern, whom he had charged to wake him. Ten o'clock, sir. "'What's the matter? Ten o'clock, sir.' "'What do you mean? Ten o'clock at night?' "'Yes, sir. Your Honor told me to call you.' "'Oh, oh, I remember. Very well. Very well.' After a few dull efforts to get to sleep again, which the man dexterously combated by stirring the fire continuously for five minutes, he got up, tossed his hat on, and walked out. He turned into the temple, and, having revived himself by twice pacing the pavements of King's Bench Walk and paper buildings, turned into the Stryver chambers. The Stryver clerk, who never assisted at these conferences, had gone home, and the Stryver principal opened the door. He had his slippers on, and a loose bedgown, and his throat was bare for his greater ease. He had that rather wild, strained, seared marking about his eyes, which may be observed in all free livers of his class, from the portrait of Jeffreys downward, and which can be traced under various disguises of art through the portraits of every drinking age. "'You're a little late, memory,' said Stryver. "'About the usual time. It may be a quarter of an hour later.' They went into a dingy room lined with books and littered with papers, where there was a blazing fire. A kettle steamed upon the hob, and in the midst of the wreck of papers a table shone with plenty of wine upon it, and brandy, and rum, and sugar, and lemons. You have had your bottle, I perceive, Sidney. Two tonight, I think. I have been dining with the day's client, or seeing him dine, it's all one. That was a rare point, Sidney, that you brought to bear upon the identification. How came you by it? When did it strike you? I thought he was a rather handsome fellow, and I thought I should have been much the same sort of fellow if I'd had any luck. Mr. Stryver laughed till he shook his precocious paunch. You and your luck, Sidney. Get to work. Get to work. Sullenly enough, the jackal loosed his dress, went into an adjoining room, and came back with a large jug of cold water, a basin, and a towel or two. Steeping the towels in the water and partially wringing them out, he folded them on his head in a manner hideous to behold, sat down at the table, and said, Now I am ready. Not much boiling down to be done tonight, memory, said Mr. Stryver gaily, as he looked among his papers. How much? Only two sets of them. Give me the worst first. There they are, Mr. Sidney. Fire away. The lion then composed himself on his back on a sofa on one side of the drinking table, while the jackal sat at his own paper-bestrewn table proper, on the other side of it, with the bottles and glasses ready to his hand. Both resorted to the drinking table without stint, but each in a different way, the lion for the most part reclining with his hands in his waistband, looking at the fire, or occasionally flirting with some lighter document. The jackal, with knitted brows and intent face so deep in his task that his eyes did not even follow the hand he stretched out for the glass, which often groped about for a minute or more before he found the glass where his lips, two or three times the matter in his hand became so knotty that the jackal found it imperative on him to get up and steep the towels anew. From these pilgrimages to the jug and basin 
he returned with such eccentricities of damp headgear as no words can describe, which were made more ludicrous by his anxious gravity. At length the jackal had got together a compact repast for the lion and proceeded to offer it to him. The lion took it with care and caution, made his selections from it and his remarks upon it, and the jackal assisted both. When the repast was fully discussed, the lion put his hands in his waistband again and lay down to meditate. The jackal then invigorated himself with a bum for his throttle and a fresh application to his head and applied himself to the collection of a second meal. This was administered to the lion in the same manner, and was not disposed of until the clock struck three in the morning. "'And now we have done, Sidney. Fill a bumper of punch,' said Mr. Stryver. The jackal removed the towels from his head, which had been steaming again, shook himself, yawned, shivered, and complied. You were very sound, Sidney, in the matter of the three crown witnesses today, every question told. I am always sound, am I not? I don't gainsay it, which has roughened your temper. Put some punch into it and smooth it again. With a deprecatory grunt, the jackal again complied. The old Sidney Carton of old Shrewsbury School, said Stryver, nodding his head over him as he reviewed him in the present and the past, the old seesaw Sydney, one minute up, down the next, now in spirits and now in despondency. Ah, returned the other, sighing, yes, the same Sydney with the same luck. Even then I did exercises for the other boys and seldom did my own. And why not? God knows. It was my way, I suppose. He sat with his hands in his pockets and his legs stretched out before him, looking at the fire. Carton, said his friend, squaring himself at him with a bullying air as if the fire grate had been the furnace in which sustained endeavor was forged, and the one delicate thing to be done for the old Sidney Carton of old Shrewsbury School was to shoulder him into it. Your way is, and always was, a lame way. You summon no energy and purpose. Look at me. Oh, botheration, returned Sidney, with a lighter and more good-humored laugh. Don't you be moral. How have I done what I have done, said Stryver? How do I do what I do? Partly through paying me to help you, I suppose. But it's not worth your while to apostrophize me on the air about it. What you want to do, you do. You are always in the front rank and I was always behind. I had to get to the front rank. I was not born there, was I? I was not present at the ceremony, but my opinion is you were, said Carton. At this he laughed again, and they both laughed. Before Shrewsbury, and at Shrewsbury, and ever since Shrewsbury, pursued Carton, you have fallen into your rank, and I have fallen into mine. Even then we were fellow students in the student quarter of Paris, picking up French and French law and other French crumbs that we didn't get much good of. You were always somewhere, and I was always nowhere. And whose fault was that? Upon my soul, I am not sure that it was not yours. You were always driving and writhing and shouldering and passing to that restless degree that I had no chance for my life but in rust and repose. It's a gloomy thing, however, to talk about one's own past with the day breaking. Turn me in some other direction before I go. Well, then, pledge me to the pretty witness, said Stryver, holding up his glass. Are you turned in a pleasant direction? Apparently not, for he became gloomy again. Pretty witness, he muttered, looking down into his glass. I have had enough of witnesses today and tonight. Who's your pretty witness? The picturesque doctor's daughter, Miss Manette. She pretty? Is she not? No. Why, man alive, she was the admiration of the whole court. Rot the admiration of the whole court. Who made the old Bailey a judge of beauty? She was a golden-haired doll. Do you know, Sidney, said Mr. Stryver, looking at him with sharp eyes and slowly drawing a hand across his florid face, do you know I rather thought at the time that you sympathized with the golden-haired doll, and were quick to see what happened to the golden-haired doll? 
quick to see what happened. If a girl, doll or no doll, swoons within a yard or two of a man's nose, he can see it without a perspective glass. I pledge you, but I deny the beauty. And now I'll have no more to drink. I'll get to bed. When his host followed him out on the staircase with a candle to light him down the stairs, the day was coldly looking in through its grimy windows. When he got out of the house the air was cold and sad, the dull sky overcast, the river dark and dim, the whole scene like a lifeless desert. And wreaths of dust were spinning round and round before the morning blast, as if the desert sand had risen far away, and the first spray of it on its advance had begun to overwhelm the city. Waste forces within him, and a desert all round, this man stood still on his way to a silent terrace, and saw, for a moment lying in the wilderness before him, a mirage of honorable ambition self-denial and perseverance. In the fair city of his vision there were airy galleries from which the loves and graces looked upon him, gardens in which the fruits of life hung ripening, waters of hope that sparkled in his sight. A moment and it was gone. Climbing to a high chamber in a well of houses, he threw himself down in his clothes on a neglected bed, and its pillow was wet with wasted tears. Sadly, sadly the sun rose. It rose upon no sadder a sight than the man of good abilities and good emotions, incapable of their directed exercise, incapable of his own help and his own happiness, sensible of the blight on him, and resigning himself to let it eat him away. Thus ends Book Two, Chapter Five, The Jackal. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book the Second, The Golden Thread. Chapter Six, Hundreds of People. The quiet lodgings of Dr. Manette were in a quiet street corner not far from Soho Square. On the afternoon of a certain fine Sunday, when the waves of four months had roiled over the trial for treason, and carried it, as to the public interest and memory, far out to sea, Mr. Jarvis Lorry walked along the sunny streets from Clerkenwell, where he lived, on his way to dine with the doctor. After several relapses into business absorption, Mr. Lorry had become the doctor's friend, and the quiet street corner was the sunny part of his life. On this certain fine Sunday, Mr. Lorry walked towards Soho, early in the afternoon, for three reasons of habit. Firstly, because on fine Sundays he often walked out before dinner with the doctor and Lucy. Secondly, because on unfavorable Sundays he was accustomed to be with them as the family friend, talking, reading, looking out of window, and generally getting through the day. Thirdly, because he happened to have his own little shrewd doubts to solve, and knew how the ways of the doctor's household pointed to that time as a likely time for solving them. A quainter corner than the corner where the doctor lived was not to be found in London. There was no way through it, and the front windows of the doctor's lodgings commanded a pleasant little vista of street that had a congenial air of retirement on it. There were a few buildings then, north of the Oxford Road, and forest trees flourished and wild flowers grew, and the hawthorn blossomed in the now vanished fields. As a consequence, country air circulated in Soho with vigorous freedom, instead of languishing into the parish like stray paupers without a settlement. And there was many a good south wall not far off, on which the peaches ripened in their season. The summer light struck into the corner brilliantly in the earlier part of the day, but, when the streets grew hot, the corner was in shadow, though not in shadow so remote that you could not see beyond it into a glare of brightness. It was a cool spot, staid but cheerful, a wonderful place for echoes and a very harbor from the raging streets. There ought to have been a tranquil bark in such an anchorage, and there was. The doctor occupied two floors of a large, stiff house, where several callings purported to be pursued by day, but whereof little was audible any day, and which was shunned by all of them at night. In a building at the back, attainable by a courtyard where a plane tree rustled its green leaves, 
church organs claimed to be made, and silver to be chased, and likewise gold to be beaten by some mysterious giant who had a golden arm starting out of the wall of the front hall, as if he had beaten himself precious, and menaced a similar conversion of all visitors. Very little of these trades, or of a lonely lodger rumored to live upstairs, or of a dim coach-trimming maker asserted to have a counting-house below, was ever heard or seen. Occasionally a stray workman putting his coat on traversed the hall, or a stranger peered about there, or a distant clink was heard across the courtyard, or a thump from the golden giant. These, however, were only the exceptions required to prove the rule that the sparrows in the plane tree behind the house, and the echoes in the corner before it, had their own way from Sunday morning unto Saturday night. Dr. Manette received such patience here as his old reputation, and its revival in the floating whispers of his story brought him. His scientific knowledge, and his vigilance and skill in conducting ingenious experiments, brought him otherwise into moderate request, and he earned as much as he wanted. These things were within Mr. Jarvis Lorry's knowledge, thoughts, and notice when he rang the doorbell of the tranquil house in the corner on the fine Sunday afternoon. Dr. Manette at home? Expected home. Miss Lucy at home? Expected home. Miss Pross at home? Possibly at home, but of a certainty impossible for a handmaid to anticipate intentions of Miss Pross as to admission or denial of the fact. As I am at home myself, said Mr. Lorry, I'll go upstairs. Although the doctor's daughter had known nothing of the country of her birth, she appeared to have innately derived from it that ability to make much of little means, which is one of its most useful and most agreeable characteristics. Simple as the furniture was, it was set off by so many little adornments, of no value but for their taste and fancy, that its effect was delightful. The disposition of everything in the rooms, from the largest object to the least, the arrangement of colors, the elegant variety and contrast attained by thrift in trifles, by delicate hands, clear eyes, and good sense, were at once so pleasant in themselves, and so expressive of their originator, that, as Mr. Lorry stood looking about him, the very chairs and tables seemed to ask him, with something of that peculiar expression which he knew so well by this time, whether he approved. There were three rooms on a floor, and the doors by which they communicated being put open that the air might pass freely through them all, Mr. Lorry, smilingly observant of that fanciful resemblance which he detected all around him, walked from one to another. The first was the best room, and in it were Lucy's birds, and flowers, and books, and desk, and works table, and box of watercolors. The second was the doctor's consulting room, used also as the dining room. The third, changingly speckled by the rustle of the plane tree in the yard, was the doctor's bedroom. And there, in a corner, stood the disused shoemaker's bench and tray of tools much as it had stood on the fifth floor of the dismal house by the wine-shop in the suburb of saint antoine in paris i wonder said mr lorry pausing in his looking about that he keeps that reminder of his sufferings about him and why wonder at that was the abrupt inquiry that made him start it proceeded from Miss Pross, the wild red woman, strong of hand, whose acquaintance he had first made at the Royal George Hotel in Dover, and had since improved. "'I should have thought,' Mr. Lorry began. "'Pooh! You'd have thought,' said Miss Pross, and Mr. Lorry left off. "'How do you do?' inquired the lady then, sharply, and yet as if to express that she bore him no malice. "'I am pretty well, I thank you,' answered Mr. Lorry, with meekness. How are you? Nothing to boast of, said Miss Pross. Indeed? Ah, indeed, said Miss Pross. I am very much put out about my ladybird. Indeed? For gracious sake, say something else besides indeed, or you'll fidget me to death, said Miss Pross, whose character, dissociated from stature, was shortness. Really, then, said Mr. Lorry, as an amendment, "'Really is bad enough,' returned Miss Pross, but better. "'Yes, I am very much put out. "'May I ask the cause? "'I don't want dozens of people who are not all worthy of Lady Bird "'to come here looking after her,' said Miss Pross. "'Do dozens come for that purpose?' Hundreds, said Miss Pross. "'It was characteristic of this lady, as of some other people before her time and sense, "'that whenever her original proposition was questioned, she exaggerated it. 
"'Dear me!' said Mr. Lorry, as the safest remark he could think of. "'I have lived with the darling, or the darling has lived with me, and paid for it, which she certainly should never have done, you may take your affidavit, if I could have afforded to keep either myself or her for nothing, since she was ten years old. And it's really very hard,' said Miss Pross. Not seeing with precision what was very hard, Mr. Lorry shook his head, using that important part of himself as sort of a fairy cloak that could fit anything. "'All sorts of people who are not in the least degree worthy of the pet are always turning up,' said Miss Pross. "'When you began it—' "'I began it, Miss Pross?' "'Didn't you? Who brought her father to life?' "'Oh, if that was beginning it,' said Mr. Lorry. "'It wasn't ending it, I suppose. I say, when you began it, it was hard enough, not that I have any fault to find with Dr. Manette, except that he is not worthy of such a daughter, which is no imputation on him, for it was not to be expected that anybody should be, under any circumstances. But it is really doubly and trebly hard to have crowds and multitudes of people turning up after him, I could have forgiven him, to take Lady Bird's affections away from me. Mr. Lorry knew Miss Pross to be very jealous. But he also knew her by this time to be, beneath the service of her eccentricity, one of those unselfish creatures, found only among women, who will, for pure love and admiration, bind themselves willing slaves, to youth when they have lost it, to beauty that they never had, to accomplishments that they were never fortunate enough to gain, to bright hopes that never shone upon their own somber lives. He knew enough of the world to know that there is nothing in it better than the faithful service of the heart so rendered, and so free from any mercenary taint, he had such an exalted respect for it, that in the retributive arrangements made by his own mind, we all make such arrangements, more or less, he stationed Miss Pross much nearer to the lower angels than many ladies immeasurably better got up both by nature and art, who had balances at Telson's. "'There never was nor will be but one man worthy of Ladybird,' said Miss Pross. "'And that was my brother Solomon, if he hadn't made a mistake in life.' Here again, Mr. Lorry's inquiries into Miss Pross's personal history had established the fact that her brother Solomon was a heartless scoundrel who had stripped her of everything she possessed, as a stake to speculate with, and had abandoned her in her poverty forevermore, with no touch of compunction. Miss Pross's fidelity of belief in Solomon, deducting a mere trifle for this slight mistake, was quite a serious matter with Mr. Lorry, and had its weight in his good opinion of her. As we happen to be alone for the moment, and are both people of business, he said, when they had got back to the drawing-room and had sat down there in friendly relations, let me ask you, does the doctor, in talking with Lucy, never refer to the shoemaking time yet? Never. And yet he keeps that bench and those tools beside him? Ah, returned Miss Pross, shaking her head, but I don't say he don't refer to it within himself. Do you believe that he thinks of it much? I do said Miss Pross. Do you imagine, Mr. Lorry had begun, when Miss Pross took him up short with, never imagine anything, have no imagination at all. I stand corrected. Do you suppose, you go so far as to suppose sometimes? Now and then, said Miss Pross. Do you suppose, Mr. Lorry went on, with a laughing twinkle in his bright eye as it looked kindly at her, that Dr. Manette has any theory of his own, preserved through all those years, relative to the cause of his being so oppressed, perhaps even to the name of his oppressor? I don't suppose anything about it but what Lady Bird tells me. And that is, that she thinks he has. Now, don't be angry at my asking all these questions, because I am a mere dull man of business, and you are a woman of business. Dull? Miss Pross inquired with placidity. Rather wishing his modest adjective away, Mr. Lorry replied, No, 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 surely not. To return to business, is it not remarkable that Dr. Manette, unquestionably innocent of any crime, as we all are well assured he is, should never touch upon that question? I will not say with me, though he has had business relations with me many years ago, and we are now intimate. I will say with the fair daughter to whom he is so devotedly attached, and who is so devotedly attached to him. Believe me, Miss Pross, I don't approach the subject with you out of curiosity, but out of zealous interest. Well, to the best of my understanding, and bad's the best, you'll tell me, Miss Pross, softened by the tone of apology, he is afraid of the whole subject. Afraid? It's plain enough, I should think, why he may be. It's a dreadful remembrance. 
Besides that, his loss of himself grew out of it. Not knowing how he lost himself or how he recovered himself, he may never feel certain of not losing himself again. That alone wouldn't make the subject pleasant, I should think. It was a profounder remark than Mr. Lorry had looked for. True, said he, and fearful to reflect upon. Yet a doubt lurks in my mind, Miss Pross, whether it is good for Dr. Manette to have that suppression always shut up within him. Indeed, it is this doubt, and the uneasiness it sometimes causes me, that has led me to our present confidence. "'Can't be helped,' said Miss Pross, shaking her head. "'Touch that string, and he instantly changes for the worse. Better leave it alone. In short, must leave it alone, like or no. Sometimes he gets up in the dead of night, and will be heard, by us overhead there, walking up and down, walking up and down in his room. Ladybird has learnt to know then that his mind is walking up and down, walking up and down in his old prison. She hurries to him, and they go on together, walking up and down, walking up and down, until he is composed. But he never says a word of the true reason of his restlessness to her, and she finds it best not to hint at it to him. In silence they go walking up and down together, walking up and down together, till her love and company have brought him to himself. Notwithstanding Miss Pross's denial of her own imagination, there was a perception of the pain of being monotonously haunted by one sad idea in her repetition of the phrase, walking up and down, which testified to her possessing such a thing. The corner has been mentioned as a wonderful corner for echoes, and it had begun to echo so resoundingly to the tread of coming feet, that it seemed as though the very mention of that weary pacing to and fro had set it going. "'Here they are,' said Miss Pross, rising to break up the conference. "'And now we shall have hundreds of people pretty soon.' It was such a curious corner in its acoustical properties, such a peculiar ear of a place, that as Mr. Lorry stood at the open window, looking for the father and daughter whose steps he heard, he fancied they would never approach. Not only would the echoes die away, as though the steps had gone, but echoes of other steps that never came would also be heard in their stead, and would die away for good when they seemed close at hand. However, father and daughter did at last appear, and Miss Pross was ready at the street door to receive them. Miss Pross was a pleasant sight, albeit wild and red and grim, taking off her darling's bonnet when she came upstairs, and touching it up with the ends of her handkerchief, and blowing the dust off it, and folding her mantle ready for laying by, and smoothing her rich hair with as much pride as she could possibly have taken in her own hair if she had been the vainest and handsomest of women. Her darling was a pleasant sight, too, embracing her and thanking her, and protesting against her taking so much trouble for her which last she only dared to do playfully, or Miss Pross, sorely hurt, would have retired to her own chamber and cried. The doctor was a pleasant sight, too, looking on at them, and telling Miss Pross how she spoilt Lucy, in accents and with eyes that had as much spoiling in them as Miss Pross had, and would have had more if it were possible. Mr. Lorry was a pleasant sight, too, beaming at all of this in his wig, thanking his bachelor stars for having lighted him in his declining years to a home. But no hundreds of people came to see the sights, and Mr. Lorry looked in vain for the fulfillment of Miss Pross's prediction. Dinner time, and still no hundreds of people. In the arrangements of the little household, Miss Pross took charge of the lower regions, and always acquitted herself marvelously. Her dinners, a very modest quantity, were so well cooked, and so well served, and so neat in their contrivances, half English and half French, that nothing could be better. Miss Pross's friendship being of the thoroughly practical kind, she had ravaged Soho and the adjacent provinces in search of impoverished French, who, tempted by shillings and half-crowns, would impart culinary mysteries to her. From these decayed sons and daughters of Gaul, she had acquired such wonderful arts that the woman and girl who formed the staff of domestics regarded her as quite a sorceress, or Cinderella's godmother, who would send out for a fowl, a rabbit, a vegetable or two from the garden, and change them into anything she pleased. On Sundays, Miss Pross dined at the doctor's table, but on other days persisted in taking her meals at unknown periods, either in the lower regions or in her own room on the second floor, a blue chamber to which no one but her ladybird ever gained admittance. On this occasion, Miss Pross, responding to Ladybird's pleasant face and pleasant efforts to please her, unbent exceedingly, so the dinner was very pleasant, too. 
It was an oppressive day, and after dinner Lucy proposed that the wine should be carried out under the plane tree, and they should sit there in the air. As everything turned upon her and revolved about her, they went out under the plane tree, and she carried the wine down for the special benefit of Mr. Lorry. She had installed herself some time before as Mr. Lorry's cup-bearer, and while they sat under the plane tree talking, she kept his glass replenished. Mysterious backs and ends of houses peeped at them as they talked, and the plane tree whispered to them in its own way above their heads. Still, the hundreds of people did not present themselves. Mr. Darnay presented himself while they were sitting under the plane tree, but he was only one. Dr. Manette received him kindly, and so did Lucy. But Miss Pross suddenly became afflicted with a twitching in the head and body, and retired into the house. She was not unfrequently the victim of this disorder, and she called it, in familiar conversation, a fit of the jerks. The doctor was in his best condition, and looked specially young. The resemblance between him and Lucy was very strong at such times, and as they sat side by side, she leaning on his shoulder, and he resting his arm on the back of her chair, it was agreeable to trace the likeness. He had been talking all day on many subjects, and with unusual vivacity. "'Pray, Dr. Manette,' said Mr. Darnay, as they sat under the plane tree, and he set it in the natural pursuit of the topic in hand, which happened to be the old buildings of London, "'Have you seen much of the tower?' Lucy and I have been there, but only casually. We have seen enough of it to know that it teems with interest, little more. I have been there, as you remember, said Darnay with a smile, though reddening a little angrily, in another character, and not in a character that gives facilities for seeing much of it. They told me a curious thing when I was there. What was that? Lucy asked. In making some alterations, the workmen came up on an old dungeon, which had been, for many years, built up and forgotten. Every stone of its inner wall was covered by inscriptions which had been carved on by prisoners. Dates, names, complaints, and prayers. Upon a cornerstone in an angle of the wall, one prisoner, who seemed to have gone to execution, had cut as his last work three letters. They were done with some very poor instrument and hurriedly, with an unsteady hand. At first they were read as D-I-C. But on being more carefully examined, the last letter was found to be a G. There was no record or legend of any prisoner with those initials, and many fruitless guesses were made what the names could have been. At length, it was suggested that the letters were not initials, but the complete word, dig. The floor was examined very carefully under the inscription, and in the earth, beneath a stone or tile or some fragment of paving, were found the ashes of a paper mingled with the ashes of a small leathern case or bag. What the unknown prisoner had written will never be read, but he had written something, and hidden it away to keep it from the gaoler. "'My father!' exclaimed Lucy. "'You are ill!' He had suddenly started up with his hand to his head. His manner and his look quite terrified them all. "'No, my dear, not ill. There are large drops of rain falling, and they made me start. We had better go in." He recovered himself almost instantly. Rain was really falling in large drops, and he showed the back of his hand with raindrops on it. But he said not a single word in reference to the discovery that had been told of, and, as they walked into the house, the business eye of Mr. Lorry either detected, or fancied it detected, on his face, as it turned towards Charles Darnay, the same singular look that had been upon it when it turned towards him in the passages of the courthouse. He recovered himself so quickly, however, that Mr. Lorry had doubts of his business eye. The arm of the golden giant in the hall was not more steady than he was when he stopped under it to remark to them that he was not yet proof against slight surprises, if he ever would be, and that the rain had startled him. Tea time, and Miss Pross went to make tea, with another fit of the jerks upon her, and yet no hundreds of people. Mr. Carton had lounged in, but he made only two. The night was so very sultry that although they sat with windows and doors open, they were overpowered by heat. When the tea table was done with, they all moved to one of the windows and looked out into the heavy twilight. Lucy sat by her father, Darnay sat beside her, Carton leaned against a window. The curtains were long and white, and some of the thunder gusts that whirled into the corner caught them up to the ceiling and waved them like spectral wings. The raindrops are still falling, large, heavy, and few, said Dr. Manette, 
It comes slowly. It comes surely, said Carton. They spoke low, as people watching and waiting mostly do, as people in a dark room, watching and waiting for lightning, always do. There was a great hurry in the streets of people speeding away to get shelter before the storm broke. The wonderful corner for echoes resounded with the echoes of footsteps coming and going, yet not a footstep was there. A multitude of people, and yet a solitude, said Darnay, when they had listened for a while. Is it not impressive, Mr. Darnay? asked Lucy. Sometimes I have sat here of an evening, until I have fancied, but even the shade of a foolish fancy makes me shudder to-night, when all is so black and solemn. Let us shudder, too. We may know what it is. It will seem nothing to you. Such whims are only impressive as we originate them, I think. They are not to be communicated. I have sometimes sat alone here of an evening, listening, until I have made the echoes out to be the echoes of all the footsteps coming by and by into our lives. There is a great crowd coming one day into our lives, if that be so, Sidney Carton struck in, in his moody way. The footsteps were incessant, and the hurry of them became more and more rapid. The corner echoed and re-echoed with the tread of feet, some, as it seemed, under the windows, some, as it seemed, in the room. Some coming, some going, some breaking off, some stopping altogether. All in the distant streets, and not one within sight. Are all these footsteps destined to come to all of us, Miss Manette? Are we to divide them among ourselves? I don't know, Mr. Darnay. I told you it was a foolish fancy, but you asked for it. When I have yielded myself to it, I have been alone, and then I have imagined them the footsteps of people who are to come into my life and my father. I take them into mine, said Carton. I ask no questions and make no stipulations. There's a great crowd bearing down upon us, Miss Manette, and I see them by the lightning. He added the last words after there had been a vivid flash which had shown him lounging in the window. And I hear them, he added again after a peal of thunder. Here they come, fast, fierce, and furious. It was the rush and roar of rain that he typified, and it stopped him, for no voice could be heard in it. A memorable storm of thunder and lightning broke with that sweep of water, and there was not a moment's interval in crash and fire and rain until after the moon rose at midnight. The great bell of St. Paul's was striking one in the cleared air when Mr. Lorry, escorted by Jerry, high-booted and wearing a lantern, set forth on his return passage to Clerkenwell. There were solitary patches of road on the way between Soho and Clerkenwell, and Mr. Lorry, mindful of footpads, always retained Jerry for this service, though it was usually performed a good two hours earlier. "'What a night it has been, almost a night, Jerry,' said Mr. Lorry, to bring the dead out of their graves. "'I never see the night myself, Master, nor yet I don't expect to. What would do that?' answered Jerry. "'Good night, Mr. Carton,' said the man of business. "'Good night, Mr. Darnay. Shall we ever see such a night again together? Perhaps.' perhaps see the great crowd of people with its rush and roar bearing down upon them too end of book 2 chapter 6 hundreds of people read by tora in yellowstone national park october 2006Monseigneur, one of the great lords in power at the court, held his fortnightly reception in his grand hotel in Paris. Monseigneur was in his inner room, his sanctuary of sanctuaries, the holiest of holies to the crowd of worshippers in the suite of rooms without. Monseigneur was about to take his chocolate. Monseigneur could swallow a great many things with ease, and was by some few sullen minds supposed to be rather rapidly swallowing France but his morning's chocolate could not so much as get into the throat of Monseigneur without the aid of four strong men besides the cook. Yes, it took four men, 
all four ablaze with gorgeous decoration, and the chief of them unable to exist with fewer than two gold watches in his pocket, emulative of the noble and chaste fashion set by Monseigneur, to conduct the happy chocolate to Monseigneur's lips. One lackey carried the chocolate pot into the sacred presence. A second milled and frothed the chocolate with the little instrument he bore for that function. A third presented the favored napkin. A fourth, he of the two gold watches, poured the chocolate out. It was impossible for Monseigneur to dispense with one of these attendants on the chocolate and hold his high place under the admiring heavens. Deep would have been the blot upon his escutcheon if his chocolate had been ignobly waited on by only three men. He must have died of two. Monseigneur had been out at a little supper last night where the comedy and the grand opera were charmingly re represented. Monseigneur was out at a little supper most nights with fascinating company. So polite and so impressible was Monseigneur that the comedy and the grand opera had far more influence with him in the tiresome articles of state affairs and state secrets than the needs of all France. A happy circumstance for France, as the like always is for all countries similarly favoured, always was for England, by way of example, in the regretted days of the Mary Stuart, who sold it. Monseigneur had one truly noble idea of general public business, which was to let everything go on in its own way. Of particular public business, Monseigneur had the other truly noble idea that it must all go his way, tend to his own power and pocket. Of his pleasures, general and particular, Monseigneur had the other truly noble idea, that the world was made for them. The text of his order, altered from the original by only a pronoun which is not much, ran, The earth and the fullness thereof are mine, saith Monseigneur. Yet Monseigneur had slowly found that vulgar embarrassments crept into his affairs, both private and public and he had, as to both classes of affairs, allied himself perforce with a farmer-general. As to finances public, because Monseigneur could not make anything at all of them, and must consequently let them out to somebody who could, as to finances private, because farmer-generals were rich, and Monseigneur, after generations of great luxury and expense, was growing poor. Hence, Monseigneur had taken his sister from a convent, while there was yet time to ward off the impending veil, the cheapest garment she could wear, and had bestowed her as a prize upon a very rich farmer-general, poor in family. Which farmer-general, carrying an appropriate cane with a golden apple on the top of it, was now among the company in the outer rooms, much prostrated before by mankind, always excepting superior mankind of the blood of Monseigneur, who, his own wife included, looked down upon him with the loftiest contempt. A sumptuous man was the farmer-general. Thirty horses stood in his stables, twenty-four male domestics sat in his halls, six body-women waited on his wife. As one who pretended to do nothing but plunder and forage where he could, the farmer-general, howsoever his matrimonial relations conducted to social morality, was at least the greatest reality among the personages who attended the hotel of Monseigneur that day. For the rooms, though a beautiful scene to look at, and adorned with every device of decoration that the taste and skill of the time could achieve, were in truth not a sound business. Considered with any reference to the scarecrows in the rags and nightcaps elsewhere, and not so far off either but that the watching towers of Notre Dame, almost equidistance from the two extremes, could see them both, they would have been an exceedingly uncomfortable business, if that could have been anybody's business at the house of Monseigneur. Military officers destitute of military knowledge, naval officers with no idea of a ship, civil officers without a notion of affairs, brazen ecclesiasts of the worst world worldly with sensual eyes, loose tongues, and looser lives, all totally unfit for their several callings, all lying horribly in pretending to belong to them, but all nearly or remotely of the order of Monseigneur, 
and therefore foisted on all public employments from which anything was to be got. These were to be told off by the score and the score. People not immediately connected with Monseigneur or the State, yet equally unconnected with anything that was real, or with the lives passed in travelling by any straight road to any true earthly end, were no less abundant. Doctors who made great fortunes out of dainty remedies for imaginary disorders that never existed, smiled upon their courtly patients in the antechambers of Monseigneur. Projectors who had discovered every kind of remedy for the little evils with which the state was touched, except the remedy of setting to work in earnest to root out a single sin, poured their distracting babble into any ears they could lay hold of at the reception of Monseigneur. Unbelieving philosophers who were remodeling the world with words, and making card towers of Babel to scale the skies with, talked with unbelieving chemists who had an eye on the transmutation of metals at this wonderful gathering accumulated by Monseigneur. Exquisite gentlemen of the finest breeding, which was at that remarkable time, and has been since, to be known by its fruits of indifference to every natural subject of human interest, were in the most exemplary state of exhaustion at the Hotel of Monseigneur. Such homes had these various notabilities left behind them in the fine world of Paris, that the spies among the assembled devotees of Monseigneur, forming a goodly half of the polite company, would have found it hard to discover among the angels of that sphere one solitary wife who in her manners and appearance owned to being a mother. Indeed, except for the mere act of bringing a troublesome creature into this world, which does not go far towards the realization of the name mother, there was no such thing known to the fashion. Peasant women kept the unfashionable babies close and brought them up, and charming grandmamas of sixty dressed and supped as at twenty. The leprosy of unreality disfigured every human creature in attendance upon Monseigneur. In the outermost room were half a dozen exceptional people who had had, for a few years, some vague misgiving in them that things in general were going rather wrong. As a promising way of setting them right, half of the half-dozen had become members of a fantastic sect of convulsionists, and were even then considering within themselves whether they should foam, rage, roar, and turn cataleptic on the spot, thereby setting up a highly intelligible finger-post to the future for Monseigneur's guidance. Besides these dervishes were other three who had rushed into another sect, which mended matters with a jargon about the center of truth, holding that man had got out of the center of truth, which did not need much d demonstration, but had not got out of the circumference, and that he was to be kept from flying out of the circumference, and was even to be shoved back into the center by fasting and seeing of spirits. Among these, accordingly, much discoursing with spirits went on, and it did a world of good which never became manifest. But the comfort was that all the company at the Grand Hotel of Monseigneur were perfectly dressed. If the Day of Judgment had only been ascertained to be a dress day, everybody there would have been eternally correct. Such frizzling and powdering and sticking up of hair, such delicate complexions artificially preserved and mended, such gallant swords to look at, and such delicate honor to the sense of smell, would surely keep anything going for ever and ever. The exquisite gentlemen of the finest breeding wore little pendant trinkets that chinked as they languidly moved. These golden fetters rang like precious little bells, and what with that ringing, and with the rustle of silk and brocade and fine linen, there was a flutter in the air that fanned Saint Antoine and his devouring hunger far away. Dress was the one unfailing talisman and charm used for keeping all things in their places. Everybody was dressed for a fancy ball that was never to leave off. From the palace of the Tuileries, through Monseigneur and the whole court, through the chambers, the tribunals of justice, and all society except the scarecrows, the fancy ball descended to the common executioner, who, in pursuance of the charm, was required to officiate, frizzled, powdered, in a gold-laced coat, pumps, and white silk stockings. At the gallows and the wheel, the axe was a rarity. Monsieur Paris, 
as it was the Episcopal mode among his brother professors of the provinces, Monsieur Orléans and the rest to call him presided in this dainty dress, and who, among the company at Monseigneur's reception in that seventeen hundred and eightieth year of our Lord, could possibly doubt that a system rooted in a frizzled hangman, powdered, gold-laced, pumped, and white silk stockinged, would see the very stars out. Monseigneur, having eased his four men of their burdens, and taken his chocolate, caused the doors of the holiest of holiests to be thrown open and issued forth. Then, what submission, what cringing and fawning, what servility, what abject humiliation, as to bowing down in body and spirit, nothing in that way was left for heaven, which may have been one among other reasons why the worshippers of Monseigneur never troubled it. Bestowing a word of promise here and a smile there, a whisper on one happy slave and a wave of the hand on the other, Monseigneur affably passed through his rooms to the remote region of the circumference of truth. There Monseigneur turned and came back again, and so in due course of time got himself shut up in his sanctuary by the chocolate sprites and was seen no more. The show being over, the flutter in the air became quite a little storm, and the precious little bells went ringing downstairs. There was soon but one person left of all the crowd, and he, with his hat under his arm and his snuff-box in his hand, slowly passed among the mirrors on his way out. "'I devote you,' said this person, stopping at the last door on his way and turning in the direction of the sanctuary, "'to the devil!' With that he shook the snuff from his fingers as if he had shaken the dust from his feet, and quietly walked downstairs. He was a man of about sixty, handsomely dressed, haughty in manner, and with a face like a fine mask. A face of a transparent paleness, every feature in it clearly defined, one set expression on it. The nose, beautifully formed otherwise, was very slightly pinched at the top of each nostril. In those two compressions, or dints, the only little change that the face ever showed resided. They persisted in changing color sometimes, and they would be occasionally dilated and contracted by something like a faint pulsation. Then they gave a look of treachery and cruelty to the whole countenance. Examined with attention, its capacity of helping such a look was to be found in the line of the mouth, and the lines of the orbits of the eyes, being much too horizontal and thin. Still, in the effect of the face made, it was a handsome face, and a remarkable one. Its owner went downstairs into the courtyard, got into his carriage, and drove away. Not many people had talked with him at the reception. He had stood in a little space apart, and Monseigneur might have been warmer in his manner. It appeared, under the circumstances, rather agreeable to him to see the common people dispersed before his horses, and often barely escaping from being run down. His man drove as if he were charging an enemy, and the furious recklessness of the man brought no check into the face or to the lips of the master. The complaint had sometimes made itself audible, even in that deaf city and dumb age, that in the narrow streets without footways the fierce patrician custom of hard driving endangered and maimed the mere vulgar in a barbarous manner. But few cared enough for that to think of it a second time. And in this matter, as in all others, the common wretches were left to get out of their difficulties as they could. With a wild rattle and clatter, and an inhuman abandonment of consideration not easy to be understood in these days, the carriage dashed through the streets and swept round corners, with women screaming before it, and men clutching each other and clutching children out of its way. At last, swooping at a street corner by a fountain, one of its wheels came to a sickening little jolt, and there was a loud cry from a number of voices, and the horses reared and plunged. But for the latter inconvenience, the carriage probably would not have stopped. The carriages were often known to drive on and leave their wounded behind, and why not? But the frightened valet had got down in a hurry, and there were twenty hands at the horses' bridles. "'What has gone wrong?' said Monsieur, calmly looking out. 
a tall man in a nightcap had caught up a bundle from among the feet of the horses, and had lain it on the basement of the fountain, and was down in the mud and wet, howling over it like a wild animal. "'Pardon, Monsieur the Marquis,' said a ragged and submissive man. "'It is a child!' "'Why does he make that abominable noise? Is it his child?' "'Excuse me, Monsieur the Marquis, it is a pity. Yes.' The fountain was a little removed, for the street opened where it was into a space some ten or twelve yards square. As the tall man suddenly got up from the ground and came running at the carriage, Monsieur the Marquis clapped his hand for an instant on his sword-hilt. "'Killed!' shrieked the man in wild desperation, extending both arms at their length above his head and staring at him. "'Dead!' The people closed round and looked at Monsieur the Marquis. There was nothing revealed by the many eyes that looked at him but watchfulness and eagerness. There was no visible menacing or anger. Neither did the people say anything. After the first cry they had been silent, and they remained so. The voice of the submissive man who had spoken was flat and tame in its extreme submission. Monsieur the Marquis ran his eyes over them all, as if they had been mere rats come out of their holes. He took out his purse. "'It is extraordinary to me,' said he, "'that you people cannot take care of yourselves and your children. One or the other of you is forever in the way. How do I know what injury you have done to my horses? See, give him that.' He threw out a gold coin for the valet to pick up, and all the heads craned forward that all the eyes might look down at it as it fell. The tall man called out again with a most unearthly cry. Dead! He was arrested by the quick arrival of another man, for whom the rest made way. On seeing him, the miserable creature fell upon his shoulder, sobbing and crying, and pointing to the fountain where some women were stooping over the motionless bundle and moving gently about it. They were as silent, however, as the men. "'I know all, I know all,' said the last comer. "'Be a brave man, my Gaspar. It is better for the poor little plaything to die so than to live. It has died in a moment without pain. Could it have lived an hour as happily?' "'You are a philosopher, you there,' said the Marquis, smiling. How do they call you? They call me Defarge. Of what trade? Monsieur the Marquis, vendor of wine. Pick up that philosopher and vendor of wine, said the Marquis, throwing him another gold coin, and spend it as you will. The horse is there. Are they right? Without deigning to look at the assemblage a second time, Monsieur the Marquis leaned back in his seat and was just being driven away with the air of a gentleman who had accidentally broke some common thing and had paid for it, and could afford to pay for it, when his ease was suddenly disturbed by a coin flying into his carriage and ringing on its floor. Hold, said Monsieur the Marquis, hold the horses. Who threw that? He looked to the spot where Defarge, the vendor of wine, had stood a moment before. But the wretched father was grovelling on his face on the pavement in that spot, and the figure that stood beside him was the figure of a dark, stout woman knitting. "'You dogs!' said the Marquis, but smoothly, with an unchanged front, except as to the spots on his nose. "'I would ride over any of you very willingly, and exterminate you from the earth. If I knew which rascal threw at the carriage, and if that brigand were sufficiently near it, he should be crushed under the wheels. So cowed was their condition, and so long and hard their experience of what such a man could do to them, within the law and beyond it, that not a voice or a hand or even an eye was raised. Among the men, not one. But the woman who stood knitting looked up steadily, and looked the Marquis in the face. It was not for his dignity to notice it. His contemptuous eyes passed over her, and over all the other rats, and he leaned back in his seat again and gave the word, Go on. He was driven on, and other carriages came whirling by in quick succession. 
the minister, the state projector, the farmer general, the doctor, the lawyer, the ecclesiastic, the grand opera, the comedy, the whole fancy ball in a bright continuous flow came whirling by. The rats had crept out of their holes to look on, and they remained looking on for hours. Soldiers and police often passing between them and the spectacle, and making a barrier behind which they slunk and through which they peeped. The father had long ago taken up his bundle and bidden himself away with it, when the woman who had tended the bundle while it lay on the base of the fountain sat there watching the running of the water and the rolling of the fancy ball. When the one woman who had stood conspicuous, knitting, still knitted on with the steadfastness of fate. The water of the fountain ran, the swift river ran, the day ran into evening, so much life in the city ran into death according to rule, time and tide waited for no man. The rats were sleeping close together in their dark holes again, the fancy ball was lighted up at supper, all things ran their course. End of chapter 7 Monseigneur in Town This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Chip in Tampa, Florida, on January 18, 2006. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book the Second, Chapter Eight. Monsignor in the Country. A beautiful landscape, with the corn bright in it, but not abundant, patches of poor rye where corn should have been, patches of poor peas and beans, patches of most coarse vegetable substitutes for wheat, on inanimate nature, as on the men and women who cultivated it, a prevalent tendency toward an appearance of vegetating unwillingly, a dejected disposition to give up and wither away. Monsieur le Marquis in his touring carriage, which might have been lighter, conducted by four post-horses and two postillions, fagged up a steep hill. A blush on the countenance of Monsieur le Marquis was no impeachment of his high breeding. It was not from within. It was occasioned by an external circumstance beyond his control, the setting sun. The sunset struck so brilliantly into the traveling carriage when it gained the hilltop that its occupant was steeped in crimson. "'It will die out,' said Monsieur le Marquis, glancing at his hands, directly. In effect, the sun was so low that it dipped at the moment. When the heavy drag had been adjusted to the wheel and the carriage slid downhill with a cinderous smell in a cloud of dust, the red glow departed quickly, the sun and the marquis going down together. There was no glow left when the drag was taken off. But there remained a broken country, bold and open, a little village at the bottom of the hill, a broad sweep and rise beyond it, a church tower, a windmill, a forest for the chase, and a crag with a fortress on it used as a prison. Round upon all these darkening objects as the night drew on, the Marquis looked with an air of one who was coming near home. The village had its one poor street with its poor brewery, poor tannery, poor tavern, poor stable-yard, poor relays of post-horses, poor fountain, all the usual poor appointments. It had its poor people, too. All its people were poor. And many of them were sitting at their doors, shredding spare onions and the like for supper, while many were at the fountain, washing leaves and grasses and any small yieldings of the earth that could be eaten. Excessive sips of what made them poor were not wanting. The tax for the state. The tax for the church. The tax for the lord tax local and tax general were to be paid here and to be paid there according to solemn inscription in the little village, until the wonder was that there was any village left unswallowed. 
Few children were to be seen, and no dogs. As to the men and women, their choice on earth was stated in the prospect. Life on the lowest terms that could sustain it down in the little village under the mill, or captivity and death in the dominant prison on the crag. Heralded by a courier's in advance, and by the cracking of his postillion's whips, each twined snake-like about their heads in the evening air as if he came attended by the furies, Monsieur le Marquis drew up in his, his travelling carriage at the posting-house gate. It was hard by the fountain, and the peasants suspended their operations to look at him. He looked at them, and saw in them without knowing it the slow, sure filing down of misery-worn face and figure that was to make the meagerness of Frenchmen an English superstition which would survive the truth through the best part of a hundred years. Monsieur le Marquis cast his eyes over the submissive faces that drooped before him as the like of himself had drooped before the Monsignor of the court. The only difference was that these faces drooped merely to suffer and not to propitiate when a grizzled mender of the roads joined the group. "'Bring me hither that fellow,' said the Marquis to the courier. The fellow was brought, cap in hand and the other fellows closed round to look and listen, in the manner of the people at the Paris mountain. "'I passed you on the road?' "'Monseigneur, it is true. I had the honour of being passed on the road.' "'Coming up the hill, and at the top of the hill, both?' "'Monseigneur, it is true. What did you look at so fixedly?' "'Monseigneur, I looked at the man.' He stooped a little, and with his tattered blue cap pointed under the carriage. All his fellows stooped to look under the carriage. "'What man, pig? And why look there?' "'Pardon, Monsignor. He swung by the chain of the shoe, the drag.' "'Who?' demanded the traveller. "'Monsignor, the man.' "'May the devil carry away these idiots! How do you call the man?' You know all the men in this part of the country. Who was he? Your clemency, Monsignor. He was not a part of the country. Of all the days of the life, I never saw him. Swinging by the chain, to be suffocated? With your gracious permission, that was the wonder of it, Monsignor. His head hanging over, like this. He turned himself sideways to the carriage and leaned back with his face thrown up to the sky and his head hanging down, then recovered himself, fumbled with his cap, and made a bow. What was he like? Monsignor, he was whiter than the miller, all covered with dust, white as a specter, tall as a specter. The picture produced an immense sensation in the crowd, but all eyes, without comparing notes with other eyes, looked at Monsieur le Marquis perhaps to observe whether he had any spectre on his conscience. "'Truly you did well,' said the Marquis, felicitously sensible that such vermin were not to ruffle him. "'To see a thief accompanying my carriage, and to not open that great mouth of yours. Bah! Put him aside, Monsieur Gabel. Monsieur Gabel was the postmaster, and some other taxing functionary united, he had come out with great obsequiousness to assist at this examination, and had held the examined by the drapery of his arm in an official manner. "'Bah! Go aside,' said M. Gabel. "'Lay hands on this stranger if he seeks to lodge in your village tonight, and be sure that his business is honest, Gabel. Monsignor, I am flattered to devote myself to your orders.' "'Did he run away, fellow?' Where is that accursed? The accursed was already under the carriage with some half-dozen particular friends pointing out the chain with his blue cap. Some half-dozen other particular friends promptly hauled him out and presented him breathless to Monsieur le Marquis. Did the man run away, dolt, when he stopped for the drag? Monsignor, he precipitated himself over the hillside, head first, as a person plunges into the river. See to it, Gabel. Go on. 
the half-dozen who were peering at the chain were still among the wheels like sheep. The wheels turned so suddenly that they were lucky to save their skins and bones. They had very little else to save, or they might not have been so fortunate. The burst with which the carriage started out of the village and up the rise beyond was soon checked by the steepness of the hill. Gradually it subsided to a foot-pace, swinging and lumbering upward, among the many sweet scents of a summer night. The postillions, with a thousand gossamer gnats circling about them in lieu of the furies, quietly mended the points to the lashes of their whips. The valet walked by the horses. The courier was audible, trotting on ahead into the dun distance. At the steepest point of the hill there was a little burial ground with a cross and a new large figure of our Saviour on it. It was but a poor figure in wood, done by some inexperienced rustic carver, but he had studied the figure in the life, maybe his own life, perhaps, for it was dreadfully spare and thin. To this distressful emblem of a great distress that had long been growing worse, and was not at its worst, a woman was kneeling. She turned her head as the carriage came up to her, rose quickly, and presented herself at the carriage door. "'It is you, Monsignor! Monsignor, a petition!' With an exclamation of impatience, but with his unchangeable face, Monsignor looked out. "'How, then? What is it? Always petitions. Monsignor, for the love of the great God, my husband, the forester!' "'What of your husband, the forester? Always the same with you people. He cannot pay something?' "'He has paid all, Monsignor. He is dead.' Well, he is quiet. Can I restore him to you? Alas, no, Monsignor, but he lies yonder under a little heap of poor grass. Well, Monsignor, are there so many little heaps of poor grass? Again, well, she looked an old woman, but was young. Her manner was one of passionate grief. By turns she clasped her venous and knotted hands together with wild energy, and laid one of them on the carriage door, tenderly, caressingly, as if it had been a human breast and could be expected to feel the appealing touch. Monsignor, hear me, Monsignor, hear my petition. My husband died of want, so many die of want. So many more will die of want. Again, well, can I feed them? Monsignor, the good God knows, but I don't ask it. My petition is that a morsel of stone or wood with my husband's name may be placed over him to show where he lies. Otherwise the place will be quickly forgotten, and it will never be found when I am dead of the same malady. Shall I be laid under some other heap of poor grass, Monsignor? There are so many. They increase so fast. There is so much want. Monsignor! Monsignor! The valet had put her away from the door, the carriage had broken into a brisk trot, the postillions had quickened the pace, and she was left far behind. And Monsignor, again escorted by the Furies, was rapidly diminishing the league or two of distance that remained between him and his chateau. The sweet scents of the summer night rose all around him, and rose as the rain falls impartially on the dusty, ragged, and toil-worn group at the fountain not far away, to whom the meander of roads, with the aid of the blue cap without which he was nothing, still enlarged upon his man like a specter, as long as they could bear it. By degrees, as they could bear no more, they dropped off one by one, and lights twinkled in little casements, which lights, as the casements darkened and more stars came out, seemed to have shot up into the sky, instead of having been extinguished. The shadow of a high-roofed house and many overhanging trees was upon Monsieur le Marquis by that time, and the shadow was exchanged for the light of a flambeau, as his carriage stopped and the great door to his chateau was opened to him. Monsieur Charles, whom I expect, has he arrived from England? Monsignor, not yet. So ends Book Two, Chapter Eight. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nocturna A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens Book Two, Chapter Nine The Gorgon's Head It was a heavy mass of building, that chateau of Monsieur the Marquis, with a large stone courtyard before it, and two stone sweeps of staircase meeting in a stone terrace before the principal door. A stony business altogether, with heavy stone balustrades and stone urns and stone flowers and stone faces of men and stone heads of lions in all directions, as if the Gorgon's head had surveyed it when it was finished two centuries ago. Up the broad flight of shallow steps, Monsieur the Marquis, Flambeau proceeded, went from his carriage sufficiently disturbing the darkness to elicit loud remonstrance from an owl in the roof of the great pile of stable building away among the trees. All else was so quiet that the Flambeau carried up the steps, and the other Flambeau held at the great door, burnt as if they were in a close room of state, instead of being in the open night air. Other sound than the owl's voice there was none, save the failing of a fountain into its stone basin. For it was one of those dark nights that hold their breath by the hour together, and then heave a long low sigh, and then hold their breath again. The great door clanged behind him, and Monsieur the Marquis crossed a hall, grim with certain old boar spears, swords, and knives of the chase grimmer with certain heavy riding rods and riding whips of which many a peasant gone to his benefactor death had felt the weight when his lord was angry avoiding the larger rooms which were dark and made fast for the night monsieur the marquis with his flambeau bearer going on before went up the staircase to a door in a corridor this thrown open admitted him to his own private apartment of three rooms, his bedchamber and two others. High vaulted rooms with cool uncarpeted floors, great dogs upon the hearths for the burning of wood in winter time, and all luxuries befitting the state of a marquis, in a luxurious age and country. The fashion of the last Louis but one, of the line that was never to break, the fourteenth Louis, was conspicuous in their rich furniture, but it was diversified by many objects that were illustrations of old pages in the history of France. A supper table was laid for two in the third of the rooms, a round room in one of the chateau's four extinguisher-topped towers, a small lofty room with its window wide open and the wooden jealousy blinds closed so that the dark night only showed in slight horizontal lines of black, alternating with their broad lines of stone color. My nephew, said the Marquis, glancing at the supper preparation, they said he was not arrived. Nor was he, but he had been expected with Monseigneur. Ah, it is not probable he will arrive tonight. Nevertheless, Leave the table as it is. I shall be ready in a quarter of an hour. In a quarter of an hour, Monseigneur was ready and sat down alone to his sumptuous and choice supper. His chair was opposite to the window and he had taken his soup and was raising his glass of Bordeaux to his lips when he put it down. What is that? He calmly asked, looking with attention at the horizontal lines of black and stone color. Monseigneur, that? outside the blinds open the blinds it was done well monseigneur it is nothing the trees in the night are all that are here the servant who spoke had thrown the blinds wide had looked out into the vacant darkness and stood with that blank behind him looking round for instructions good said the imperturbable master close them again that was done too, and the Marquis went on with his supper. He was halfway through it, when he again stopped with his glass in his hand, hearing the sound of wheels. It came on briskly, 
and came up to the front of the chateau. Ask who has arrived. It was the nephew of Monseigneur. He had been some few leagues behind Monseigneur early in the afternoon. He had diminished the distance rapidly, but not so rapidly as to come up with Monseigneur on the road. He had heard of Monseigneur at the posting houses as being before him. He was to be told, said Monseigneur, that supper waited him then and there, and that he was prayed to come to it. In a little while he came. He had been known in England as Charles Darnay. Monseigneur received him in a courtly manner, but they did not shake hands. You left Paris yesterday, sir, he said to Monseigneur as he took his seat at the table. Yesterday. And you? I come direct. From London? Yes. You have been a long time coming, said the Marquis with a smile. On the contrary, I come direct. Pardon me, I mean, not a long time on the journey, a long time intending the journey. I have been detained by... The nephew stopped a moment in his answer. Various business. Without doubt, said the polished uncle. So long as a servant was present, no other words passed between them. When coffee had been served and they were alone together, the nephew, looking at the uncle and meeting the eyes of the face that was like a fine mask, opened a conversation. I have come back, sir, as you anticipate, pursuing the object that took me away. It carried me into great and unexpected peril, but it is a sacred object, and if it had carried me to death, I hope it would have sustained me. Not to death, said the uncle. It is not necessary to say to death. I doubt, sir, returned the nephew, whether if it had carried me to the utmost brink of death, you would have cared to stop me there. The deepened marks in the nose and the lengthening of the fine straight lines in the cruel face looked ominous as to that. The uncle made a graceful gesture of protest which was so clearly a slight form of good breeding that it was not reassuring. Indeed, sir, pursued the nephew, for anything I know, you may have expressly worked to give a more suspicious appearance to the suspicious circumstances that surrounded me. No, 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 said the uncle pleasantly. But however that may be, resumed the nephew, glancing at him with deep distrust, I know that your diplomacy would stop me by any means and would know no scruple as to means. My friend, I told you so, said the uncle, with a fine pulsation in the two marks. Do me the favor to recall that I told you so, long ago. I recall it. Thank you, said the Marquis, very sweetly indeed. His tone lingered in the air, almost like the tone of a musical instrument. In effect, sir, pursued the nephew, I believe it to be at once your bad fortune and my good fortune that has kept me out of a prison in France here. I do not quite understand, returned the uncle, sipping his coffee. Dare I ask you to explain? I believe that if you were not in disgrace with the court and had not been overshadowed by that cloud for years past, a letter de cachet would have sent me to some fortress indefinitely. It is possible, said the uncle, with great calmness, for the honor of the family, I could even resolve to incommode you to that extent. Pray excuse me. I perceive that happily for me, the reception of the day before yesterday was as usual a cold one, observed the nephew. I would not say happily, my friend, returned the uncle, with refined politeness. I would not be sure of that. A good opportunity for consideration, surrounded by the advantages of solitude, might influence your destiny to far greater advantage than you influence it for yourself. But it is useless to discuss the question. I am, as you say, at a disadvantage. These little instruments of correction, these gentle aids to the power and honor of families, these slight favors that might so incommode you, are only to be obtained now by interest and importunity. They are sought by so many, 
and they are granted comparatively to so few. It used not to be so, but France in all such things is changed for the worse. Our not remote ancestors held the right of life and death over the surrounding vulgar. From this room, many such dogs have been taken out to be hanged. In the next room, my bedroom, one fellow, to our knowledge, was poignarded on the spot for professing some insolent delicacy respecting his daughter. His daughter? We have lost many privileges. A new philosophy has become the mode. And the assertion of our station in these days might, I do not go so far as to say would, but might cause us real inconvenience. All very bad. Very bad. The Marquis took a gentle little pinch of snuff and shook his head, as elegantly despondent as he could becomingly be of a country still containing himself, that great means of regeneration. We have so asserted our station, both in the old time and in the modern time also, said the nephew gloomily, that I believe our name to be more detested than any name in France. Let us hope so, said the uncle. Detestation of the high is the involuntary homage of the low. There is not, pursued the nephew, in his former tone, a face I can look at in all this country round about us, which looks at me with any deference on it, but the dark deference of fear and slavery. A compliment, said the Marquis, to the grandeur of the family, merited by the manner in which the family has sustained its grandeur. Ha! And he took another gentle pinch of snuff and lightly crossed his legs. But when his nephew, leaning an elbow on the table, covered his eyes thoughtfully and dejectedly with his hand, the fine mask looked at him sideways, with a stronger concentration of keenness, closeness, and dislike, that was comportable with its wearer's assumption of indifference. Repression is the only lasting philosophy. The dark deference of fear and slavery, my friend, observed the Marquis, will keep the dogs obedient to the whip. As long as this roof, looking up to it, shuts out the sky. That might not be so long as the Marquis supposed. If a picture of the chateau as it was to be a very few years hence, and of fifty like it, as they too were to be a very few years hence, could have been shown to him that night, he might have been at a loss to claim his own from the ghastly fire-charred plunder-wrecked reins. As for the roof he vaunted, he might have found that, shutting out the sky in a new way, to wit forever, from the eyes of the bodies into which its lead was fired out of the barrels of a hundred thousand muskets. Meanwhile, said the Marquis, I will preserve the honor and repose of the family, if you will not. But you must be fatigued. Shall we terminate our conference for the night? A moment more. An hour, if you please. Sir, said the nephew, we have done wrong, and are reaping the fruits of wrong. We have done wrong, repeated the Marquis, with an inquiring smile and delicately pointing, first to his nephew, then to himself. Our family, our honorable family, whose honor is of so much account to both of us in such different ways. Even in my father's time, we did a world of wrong, injuring every human creature who came between us and our pleasure, whatever it was. Why need I speak of my father's time when it is equally yours? Can I separate my father's twin brother joint inheritor and next successor from himself. Death has done that, said the Marquis, and has left me, answered the nephew, bound to a system that is frightful to me, responsible for it, but powerless in it, seeking to execute the last request of my dear mother's lips and obey the last look of my dear mother's eyes, which implored me to have mercy and to redress and tortured by seeking assistance and power in vain. Seeking them from me, my nephew, said the Marquis, touching him on the breast with his forefinger. They were now standing by the hearth. You will forever seek them in vain, be assured. Every fine straight line in the clear whiteness of his face was cruelly, 
craftily and closely compressed. While he stood looking quietly at his nephew, with his snuff box in his hand. Once again he touched him on the breast, as though his finger were the fine point of a small sword, with which, in delicate finesse, he ran him through the body and said, My friend, I will die perpetuating the system under which I have lived. When he had said it, he took a culminating pinch of snuff and put his box in his pocket. Better to be a rational creature, he added then, after ringing a small bell on the table, and accept your natural destiny. But you are lost, Monsieur Charles, I see. This property in France are lost to me, said the nephew sadly. I renounce them. Are they both yours to renounce? France may be, but is the property? It is scarcely worth mentioning, but is it yet? I had no intention in the words I used to claim it yet. If it passed to me from you tomorrow, which I have the vanity to hope is not probable, or twenty years hence, you do me too much honor, said the Marquis. Still, I prefer that supposition. I would abandon it and live otherwise and elsewhere. It is little to relinquish. What is it but a wilderness of misery and ruin? Ha! said the Marquis, glancing round the luxurious room. To the eye it is fair enough here, but seen in its integrity under the sky and by daylight, it is a crumbling tower of waste, mismanagement, extortion, debt, mortgage, oppression, hunger, nakedness, and suffering. Ha! said the Marquis again, in a well-satisfied manner. If it ever becomes mine, it shall be put into some hands better qualified to free it slowly, if such a thing is possible, from the weight that drags it down, so that the miserable people who cannot leave it, and who have been long wrung to the last point of endurance, may in another generation suffer less. But it is not for me. There is a curse on it and on all this land. And you, said the uncle, forgive my curiosity. Do you, under your new philosophy, graciously intend to live? I must do to live what others of my countrymen, even with nobility at their backs, may have to do some day work. In England, for example? Yes, the family honor, sir, is safe from me in this country. The family name can suffer from me in no other, for I bear it in no other. The ringing of the bell had caused the adjoining bedchamber to be lighted. It now shone brightly through the door of communication. The Marquis looked that way and listened for the retreating step of his valet. England is very attractive to you, seeing how indifferently you have prospered there, he observed then, turning his calm face to his nephew with a smile. I have already said that for my prospering there I am sensible. I may be indebted to you, sir. For the rest, it is my refuge. They say, those boastful English, that it is the refuge of many. You know a compatriot who has found a refuge there. A doctor? Yes. With a daughter? Yes. Yes, said the Marquis. You are fatigued. Good night. As he bent his head in his most courtly manner, there was a secrecy in his smiling face, and he conveyed an air of mystery to those words, which struck the eyes and ears of his nephew forcibly. At the same time, the thin straight lines of the setting of the eyes, and the thin straight lips, and the markings in the nose curved with a sarcasm that looked handsomely diabolic. Yes, repeated the Marquis, a doctor with a daughter, yes, so commences the new philosophy. You are fatigued. Good night. It would have been of as much avail to interrogate any stone face outside the chateau as to interrogate that face of his. The nephew looked at him in vain in passing on to the door. Good night, said the uncle. I look to the pleasure of seeing you again in the morning. Good repose. Light Monsieur, my nephew, to his chamber there, and burn Monsieur, my nephew, in his bed, if you will, he added to himself, before he rang his little bell again, and summoned his valet to his own bedroom. The valet, come and gone, Monsieur the Marquis walked to and fro in his loose chamber robe to prepare himself gently for sleep, that hot still night. Rustling about the room, his softly slippered feet, making no noise on the floor, he moved like a refined tiger looked like some enchanted marquis of the impenitently wicked sort, 
in story, whose periodical change into tiger form was either just going off or just coming on. He moved from end to end of his voluptuous bedroom, looking again at the scraps of the day's journey that came unbidden into his mind, the slow toil up the hill at sunset, the setting sun, the descent, the mill, the prison on the crag, the little village in the hollow, the peasants at the fountain and the mender of roads with his blue cap pointing out the chain under the carriage. That fountain suggested the Paris fountain, and the little bundle lying on the step, the woman bending over it, and the tall man with his arms up crying, Dead! I am cool now, said Monsieur the Marquis, and may go to bed. So leaving only one light burning on the large hearth, he let his thin gauze curtains fall around him, and heard the night break its silence with a long sigh as he composed himself to sleep. The stone faces on the outer walls stared blindly at the black night for three heavy hours. For three heavy hours the horses in the stables rattled at their racks, the dogs barked, and the owl made a noise with very little resemblance in it to the noise conventionally assigned to the owl by men poets but it is the obstinate custom of such creatures hardly ever to say what is set down for them. For three heavy hours the stone faces of the chateau, lion and human, stared blindly at the night. Dead darkness lay on all the landscape. Dead darkness added its own hush to the hushing dust on all the roads. And the burial place had got to the pass that its little heaps of poor grass were undistinguishable from one another. The figure on the cross might have come down, for anything that could be seen of it. In the village, taxers and taxed were fast asleep, dreaming perhaps of banquets, as the starved usually do, and of ease and rest, as the driven slave and the yoked ox may. Its lean inhabitants slept soundly and were fed and freed. The fountain in the village flowed unseen and unheard and the fountain at the chateau dropped unseen and unheard, both melting away like the minutes that were falling from the spring of time through three dark hours. Then the gray water of both began to be ghostly in the light, and the eyes of the stone faces of the chateau were opened, lighter and lighter, until at last the sun touched the tops of the still trees and poured its radiance over the hill. In the glow, the water of the chateau fountain seemed to turn to blood, and the stone faces crimsoned. The carol of the birds was loud and high, and on the weather-beaten sill of the great window of the bedchamber of Monsieur the Marquis, one little bird sang its sweetest song with all its might. At this, the nearest stone face seemed to stare amazed, and with open mouth and dropped under jaw, looked awe-stricken. Now the sun was full up, and movement began in the village. Casement windows opened, crazy doors were unbarred, and people came forth shivering, chilled as yet by the new sweet air. Then began the rarely lighted toil of the day among the village population. Some to the fountain, some to the fields. Men and women here, to dig and delve, men and women there, to see to the poor livestock, and lead the bony cows out to such pasture as could be found by the roadside. In the church and at the cross, a kneeling figure or two, attendant on the latter prayers, the lead cow trying for a breakfast among the weeds at its foot. The chateau awoke later, as became its quality, but awoke gradually and surely. First the lonely boar spears and knives of the chase had been reddened as of old, then had gleamed trenchant in the morning sunshine. Now doors and windows were thrown open, horses in their stables looked round over their shoulders at the light and freshness pouring in at doorways, leaves sparkled and rustled at iron grated windows, dogs pulled hard at their chains and reared impatient to be loosed. All these trivial incidents belong to the routine of life and the return of morning. Surely, not so the ringing of the great bell of the chateau, nor the running up and down the stairs, nor the hurried figures on the terrace, 
nor the booting and tramping here and there and everywhere, nor the quick saddling of horses and riding away. What winds conveyed this hurry to the grizzled mender of roads, already at work on the hilltop beyond the village, with his day's dinner, not too much to carry, lying in a bundle, that it was worth no crow's while to peck at on a heap of stones. Had the birds, carrying some grains of it to a distance, dropped one over him as they sow chance seeds? Whether or no, the mender of roads ran on the sultry morning, as if for his life, down the hill, knee-high in dust, and never stopped till he got to the fountain. All the people of the village were at the fountain, standing about in their depressed manner, and whispering low, but showing no other emotions than grim curiosity and surprise. The lead cows, hastily brought in and tethered to anything that would hold them, were looking stupidly on, or lying down chewing the cud of nothing particularly, repaying their trouble, which they had picked up in their interrupted saunter. Some of the people of the chateau, and some of those of the posting house, and all the taxing authorities were armed, more or less, and were crowded on the other side of the little street in a purposeless way that was highly fraught with nothing. Already the mender of roads had penetrated into the mist of a group of fifty particular friends and was smiting himself in the breast with his blue cap. What did all this portend? And what portended the swift hoisting up of Monsieur Gabel behind a servant on horseback, and the conveying away of the said Gabel, double laden though the horse was, at a gallop, like a new version of the German ballad of Lenora? It portended that there was one face too many up at the chateau. The Gorgon had surveyed the building again in the night and had added one stone face wanting, the stone face for which it had waited through about two hundred years. It lay back on the pillow of Monsieur the Marquis. It was like a fine mask, suddenly startled, made angry and petrified. Driven home, into the heart of the stone figure attached to it, was a knife. Round its hilt was a frill of paper, on which was scrawled. Drive him fast to his tomb. This from Jacques. End of Book Two, Chapter Nine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Susan Denny, Denton, Texas. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book Two, Chapter Ten, Two Promises. More months, to the number of twelve, had come and gone, and Mr. Charles Darnay was established in England as a higher teacher of the French language, who was conversant with French literature. In this age, he would have been a professor. In that age, he was a tutor. He read with young men who could find any leisure and interest for the study of a living tongue spoken all over the world, and he cultivated a taste for its stores of knowledge and fancy. He could write of them, besides, in sound English, and render them into sound English. Such masters were not at that time easily found. Princes that had been, and kings that were to be, were not yet of the teacher class and no ruined nobility had dropped out of Telson's ledgers to turn cooks and carpenters. As a tutor, whose attainments made the student's way unusually pleasant and profitable, and as an elegant translator who brought something to his work besides mere dictionary knowledge, young Mr. Darnay soon became known and encouraged. He was well acquainted, moreover, with the circumstances of his country, and those were of ever-growing interest. So with great perseverance and untiring industry, he prospered. In London, he had expected neither to walk on pavements of gold, nor to lie on beds of roses. If he had had any such exalted expectation, he would not have prospered. He had expected labor, and he found it, and did it, and made the best of it 
In this his prosperity consisted. A certain portion of his time was passed at Cambridge, where he read with undergraduates as a sort of tolerated smuggler who drove a contraband trade in European languages, instead of conveying Greek and Latin through the Custom House. The rest of his time he passed in London. Now from the days when it was always summer in Eden to these days when it is mostly winter in fallen latitudes, the world of a man has invariably gone one way, Charles Darnay's way, the way of the love of a woman. He had loved Lucy Manette from the hour of his danger. He had never heard a sound so sweet and dear as the sound of her compassionate voice. He had never seen a face so tenderly beautiful as hers when it was confronted with his own on the edge of the grave that had been dug for him. But he had not yet spoken to her on the subject. The assassination at the deserted chateau far away beyond the heaving water and the long, long dusty roads, the solid stone chateau which had itself become the mere mist of a dream, had been done a year, and he had never yet, by so much as a single spoken word, disclosed to her the state of his heart. That he had reasons for this he knew full well. It was again a summer day when, lately arrived in London from his college occupation, he turned into the quiet corner in Soho, bent on seeking an opportunity of opening his mind to Dr. Manette. It was the close of the summer day, and he knew Lucy to be out with Miss Pross. He found the doctor reading in his armchair at a window. The energy which had at once supported him under his old sufferings and aggravated their sharpness had been gradually restored to him. He was now a very energetic man indeed, with great firmness of purpose, strength of resolution, and vigor of action. In his recovered energy he was sometimes a little fitful and sudden, as he had at first been in the exercise of his other recovered faculties, but this had never been frequently observable, and had grown more and more rare. He studied much, slept little, sustained a great deal of fatigue with ease, and was equably cheerful. To him now entered Charles Darnay, at sight of whom he laid aside his book and held out his hand. Charles Darnay, I rejoice to see you. We have been counting on your return these three or four days past. Mr. Stryver and Sidney Carton were both here yesterday, and both made you out to be more than due. I am obliged to them for their interest in the matter, he answered, a little coldly as to them, though very warmly as to the doctor. Miss Manette? Is well, said the doctor, as he stopped short, and your return will delight us all. She has gone out on some household matters, but will soon be home. Dr. Manette, I knew she was from home. I took the opportunity of her being from home to beg to speak to you. There was a blank silence. Yes, said the doctor with evident constraint. Bring your chair here and speak on. He complied as to the chair, but appeared to find the speaking on less easy. I have had the happiness, Dr. Manette, of being so intimate here, so he at length began, for some year and a half, that I hope the topic on which I am about to touch may not, he was stayed by the doctor's putting out his hand to stop him. When he had kept it so a little while, he said, drawing it back, Is Lucy the topic? She is. It is hard for me to speak of her at any time. It is very hard for me to hear her spoken of in that tone of yours, Charles Darnay. It is a tone of fervent admiration, true homage, and deep love, Dr. Manette, he said deferentially. There was another blank silence before her father rejoined. I believe it. I do you justice. I believe it. His constraint was so manifest and it was so manifest, too, that it originated in an unwillingness to approach the subject that Charles Darnay hesitated. 
Shall I go on, sir? Another blank. Yes, go on. You anticipate what I would say, though you cannot know how earnestly I say it, how earnestly I feel it, without knowing my secret heart, and the hopes and fears and anxieties with which it has long been laden. Dear Dr. Manette, I love your daughter fondly, dearly, disinterestedly, devotedly. If ever there were love in the world, I love her. You have loved yourself. Let your old love speak for me. The doctor sat with his face turned away, and his eyes bent on the ground. At the last words, he stretched out his hand again hurriedly and cried, Not that, sir. Let that be. I adjure you. Do not recall that. His cry was so like a cry of actual pain that it rang in Charles Darnay's ears long after he had ceased. He motioned with the hand he had extended, and it seemed to be an appeal to Darnay to pause. The latter so received it, and remained silent. "'I ask your pardon,' said the doctor, in a subdued tone, after some moments. "'I do not doubt your loving Lucy. You may be satisfied of it.' He turned toward him in his chair, but did not look at him, or raise his eyes. His chin dropped upon his hand, and his white hair overshadowed his face. "'Have you spoken to Lucy?' "'No.' "'Nor written?' "'Never.' It would be ungenerous to affect not to know that your self-denial is to be referred to your consideration for her father. Her father thanks you. He offered his hand, but his eyes did not go with it. I know, said Darnay respectfully, how can I fail to know, Dr. Manette, I who have seen you together from day to day, that between you and Miss Manette there is an affection so unusual, so touching, so belonging to the circumstances in which it has been nurtured, that it can have few parallels, even in the tenderness between a father and child. I know, Dr. Manette, how can I fail to know, that mingled with the affection and duty of a daughter who has become a woman, there is, in her heart, towards you all the love and reliance of infancy itself. I know that, as in her childhood she had no parent, so she is now devoted to you with all the constancy and fervor of her present years and character. United to the trustfulness and attachment of the early days in which you were lost to her, I know perfectly well that if you had been restored to her from the world beyond this life, you could hardly be invested in her sight with a more sacred character than that in which you are always with her. I know that when she is clinging to you, the hands of baby, girl, and woman, all in one, are round your neck. I know that in loving you she sees and loves her mother at her own age, sees and loves you at my age, loves her mother broken-hearted, loves you through your dreadful trial and in your blessed restoration. I have known this night and day since I have known you in your home. Her father sat silent, with his face bent down. His breathing was a little quickened, but he repressed all other signs of agitation. Dear Dr. Manette, always knowing this, always seeing her in you with this hallowed light about you, I have forborne and forborne as long as it was in the nature of man to do it. I have felt, and do even now feel, that to bring my love, even mine, between you, is to touch your history with something not quite so good as itself. But I love her. Heaven is my witness that I love her. I believe it, answered her father mournfully. I have thought so before now. I believe it. But do not believe, said Darnay, upon whose ear the mournful voice struck with a reproachful sound, that if my fortune were so cast as that, being one day so happy as to make her my wife, I must at any time put any separation between her and you I could or would breathe a word of what I now say. 
Besides that, I should know it to be hopeless. I should know it to be a baseness. If I had any such possibility, even at a remote distance of years, harbored in my thoughts and hidden in my heart, if it ever had been there, if it ever could be there, I could not now touch this honored hand. He laid his own upon it as he spoke. No, dear Dr. Manette, like you, a voluntary exile from France. Like you, driven from it by its distractions, oppressions, and miseries. Like you, striving to live away from it by my own exertions and trusting in a happier future, I look only to sharing your fortunes, sharing your life and home, and being faithful to you to the death. Not to divide with Lucy her privilege as your child, companion, and friend, but to come in aid of it and bind her closer to you if such a thing can be. His touch still lingered on her father's hand. Answering the touch for a moment, but not coldly, her father rested his hands upon the arms of his chair and looked up for the first time since the beginning of the conference. A struggle was evidently in his face, a struggle with that occasional look which had a tendency in it to dark doubt and dread. You speak so feelingly and so manfully, Charles Darnay, that I thank you with all my heart, and will open all my heart, or nearly so. Have you any reason to believe that Lucy loves you? None, as yet, none. Is it the immediate object of this confidence that you may at once ascertain that with my knowledge? Not even so. I might not have the hopefulness to do it for weeks. I might, mistaken or not mistaken, have that hopefulness tomorrow. Do you seek any guidance from me? I ask none, sir, but I have thought it possible that you might have it in your power, if you should deem it right, to give me some. Do you seek any promise from me? I do seek that. What is it? I well understand that without you I could have no hope. I well understand that even if Miss Manette held me at this moment in her innocent heart, do not think I have the presumption to assume so much, I could retain no place in it against her love for her father. If that be so, do you see what, on the other hand, is involved in it? I understand equally well that a word from her father in any suitor's favor would outweigh herself and all the world. For which reason, Dr. Manette, said Darnay, modestly but firmly, I would not ask that word to save my life. I am sure of it. Charles Darnay. Mysteries arise out of close love as well as out of wide division. In the former case they are subtle and delicate and difficult to penetrate. My daughter Lucy is, in this one respect, such a mystery to me. I can make no guess at the state of her heart. May I ask, sir, if you think she is? As he hesitated, her father supplied the rest. Is sought by any other suitor? It is what I meant to say. Her father considered a little before he answered. You have seen Mr. Carton here yourself. Mr. Stryver is here, too, occasionally. If it be at all, it can only be by one of these. Or both, said Darnay. I had not thought of both. I should not think either, likely. You want a promise from me. Tell me what it is. It is that if Miss Manette should bring to you at any time on her own part such a confidence as I have ventured to lay before you, you will bear testimony to what I have said and to your belief in it. I hope you may be able to think so well of me as to urge no influence against me. I say nothing more of my stake in this. This is what I ask. The condition on which I ask it, and which you have an undoubted right to require, I will observe immediately. I give the promise said the doctor, 
without any condition. I believe your object to be purely and truthfully as you have stated it. I believe your intention is to perpetuate and not to weaken the ties between me and my other and far dearer self. If she should ever tell me that you are essential to her perfect happiness, I will give her to you. If there were, Charles Darnay, if there were, the young man had taken his hand gratefully, their hands were joined as the doctor spoke, any fancies, any reasons, any apprehensions, anything whatsoever, new or old, against the man she really loved, the direct responsibility thereof not lying on his head, they should all be obliterated for her sake. She is everything to me. More to me than suffering, more to me than wrong, more to me, well, this is idle talk. So strange was the way in which he faded into silence, and so strange his fixed look, when he had ceased to speak, that Darnay felt his own hand turn cold in the hand that slowly released and dropped it. "'You said something to me,' said Dr. Manette, breaking into a smile. "'What was it you said to me?' He was at a loss how to answer, until he remembered having spoken of a condition. Relieved, as his mind reverted to that, he answered, your confidence in me ought to be returned with full confidence on my part. My present name, though but slightly changed from my mother's, is not, as you will remember, my own. I wish to tell you what that is and why I am in England. Stop, said the doctor of Beauvais. I wish it, that I may the better deserve your confidence and have no secret from you. Stop! For an instant the doctor even had his two hands at his ears, for another instant even had his two hands laid on Darnay's lips. Tell me when I ask you, not now. If your suit should prosper, if Lucy should love you, you shall tell me on your marriage morning. Do you promise? Willingly. Give me your hand. She will be home directly, and it is better she should not see us together tonight. Go. God bless you. It was dark when Charles Darnay left him, and it was an hour later and darker when Lucy came home. She hurried into the room alone, for Miss Pross had gone straight upstairs and was surprised to find his reading chair empty. My father, she called to him, father dear. Nothing was said in answer, but she heard a low hammering sound in his bedroom. Passing lightly across the intermediate room, she looked in at his door and came running back frightened, crying to herself with her blood all chilled, What shall I do? What shall I do? Her uncertainty lasted but a moment. She hurried back and tapped at his door and softly called to him. The noise ceased at the sound of her voice, and he presently came out to her, and they walked up and down together for a long time. She came down from her bed to look at him in his sleep that night. He slept heavily, and his tray of shoemaking tools and his old unfinished work were all as usual. End of Book Two, Chapter Ten This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book Two, Chapter Eleven. A Companion Picture. Sydney, said Mr. Stryver, on that self same night, or morning, to his jackal, mix another bowl of punch. I have something to say to you. Sidney had been working double tides that night, and the night before, and the night before that, and a good many nights in succession, making a grand clearance among Mr. Stryver's papers before the setting in of the long vacation. The clearance was effected at last. The Stryver arrears were handsomely fetched up. Everything was got rid of until November should come, with its fogs atmospheric and fogs legal, and being grist to the mill again. Sidney was none the livelier and none the soberer for so much application. It had taken a deal of extra wet toweling to pull him through the night. 
a correspondingly extra quantity of wine had preceded the toweling, and he was in a very damaged condition, as he now pulled his turban off and threw it into the basin in which he had steeped it at intervals for the last six hours. "'Are you mixing that other bowl of punch?' said Stryver, the portly, with his hands in his waistband, glancing round from the sofa where he lay on his back. "'I am. Now look here. I'm going to tell you something that will rather surprise you, and that perhaps will make you think me not quite as shrewd as you usually do think me. I intend to marry. Do you? Yes, and not for money. What do you say now? I don't feel disposed to say much. Who is she? Guess. Do I know her? Guess. I'm not going to guess, at five o'clock in the morning, with my brains frying and sputtering in my head. If you want me to guess, you must ask me to dinner. Well, then, I'll tell you, said Stryver, coming slowly into a sitting posture. Sidney, I rather despair of making myself intelligible to you, because you are such an insensible dog. And you, returned Sidney, busy concocting the punch, are such a sensitive and poetical spirit. Come, rejoined Stryver, laughing boastfully, though I don't prefer any claim to being the soul of romance, for I hope I know better, still I am a tenderer sort of fellow than you. You are luckier, if you mean that. I don't mean that. I mean, I'm a man of more, more, say, gallantry while you're about it, suggested Carton. Well, I'll say gallantry. My meaning is that I am a man, said Stryver, inflating himself at his friend as he made the punch. Who cares more to be agreeable? Who takes more pains to be agreeable? Who knows better how to be agreeable in a woman's society than you do? Go on, said Sidney Carton. No, but before I go on, said Stryver, shaking his head in his bullying way, I'll have this out with you. You've been at Dr. Manette's house as much as I have, or more than I have. Why, I have been ashamed of your moroseness there. Your manners have been of that silent and sullen and hangdog kind, that, upon my life and soul, I have been ashamed of you, Sidney. It should be very beneficial to a man in your practice at the bar to be ashamed of anything, returned Sidney. You ought to be much obliged to me. You shall not get off in that way, rejoined Stryver, shouldering the rejoinder at him. No, Sidney, it's my duty to tell you, and I tell you to your face to do you good, that you are a devilish, ill-conditioned fellow in that sort of society. You are a disagreeable fellow. Sidney drank a bumper of the punch he had made and laughed. Look at me, said Stryver, squaring himself. I have less need to make myself agreeable than you have, being more independent in circumstances. Why do I do it? I never saw you do it yet, muttered Curtin. I do it because it's politic. I do it on principle. And look at me. I get on. You don't get on with your account of your matrimonial intentions, answered Curtin, with a careless air. I wish you'd keep to that. As to me, will you never understand that I am incorrigible? He asked the question with some appearance of scorn. You have no business to be incorrigible, was his friend's answer, delivered in no very soothing tone. I have no business to be at all that I know of, said Cindy Carton. Who is the lady? Now, don't let my announcement of the name make you uncomfortable, Sidney, said Mr. Stryver, preparing him with ostentatious friendliness for the disclosure he was about to make. Because I know you don't mean half you say, and if you meant it all, it would be of no importance. I make this little preface because you once mentioned the young lady to me in slighting terms. I did? Certainly, and in these chambers. Sidney Carton looked at his punch, and looked at his complacent friend, drank his punch, and looked at his complacent friend. You made mention of the young lady as a golden-haired doll. The young lady is Miss Manette. If you had been a fellow of any sensitiveness or delicacy of feeling in that kind of way, Sidney, I might have been a little resentful of your employing such a designation. But you are not. You are want that sense altogether. Therefore, I am no more annoyed when I think of the expression then I should be annoyed by a man's opinion of a picture of mine who had no eye for pictures, or of a piece of music of mine who had no ear for music. Sidney Carton drank the punch at a great rate, drank it by bumpers, looking at his friend. Now you know all about it, Sid, said Mr. Stryver. I don't care about fortune. She is a charming creature, and I've made up my mind to please myself. On the whole, I think I can afford to please myself. She will have in me a man already pretty well off, and a rapidly rising man, and a man of some distinction. It is a piece of good fortune for her, but she is worthy of good fortune. Are you astonished? Carton, still drinking the punch, rejoined, Why should I be astonished? You approve? 
Carton, still drinking the punch, rejoined, Why should I not approve? Well, said his friend Stryver, you take it more easily than I fancied you would, and are less mercenary in my behalf than I thought you'd be. Though to be sure, you know well enough by this time that your ancient chum is a man of pretty strong will. Yes, Sidney, I've had enough of this style of life, and no other is a change from it. I feel that it is a pleasant thing for a man to have a home when he feels inclined to go to it. When he doesn't, he can stay away. And I feel that Miss Manette will tell well in any station, and will always do me credit. So I have made up my mind. And now, Sidney, old boy, I want to say a word to you about your prospects. You are in a bad way, you know. You really are in a bad way. You don't know the value of money. You live hard. You'll knock up one of these days and be ill and poor. You really ought to think about a nurse. The prosperous patronage with which he said it made him look twice as big as he was and four times as offensive. Now, let me recommend you, pursued Stryver, to look it in the face. I have looked it in the face in my different way. Look at it in the face, you, in your different way. Marry. Provide somebody to take care of you. Never mind your having no enjoyment of women's society, nor understanding of it, nor tact for it. Find out somebody. Find out some respectable woman with a little property. Somebody in the landlady way, or lodging-letting way, and marry her, against a rainy day. That's the kind of thing for you. Now think of it, Sidney. I'll think of it, said Sidney. End of Book Two, Chapter Eleven This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book Two, Chapter Twelve The Fellow of Delicacy. Mr. Stryver, having made up his mind to that magnanimous bestowal of good fortune on the doctor's daughter, resolved to make her happiness known to her before he left town for the long vacation. After some mental debating of the point, he came to the conclusion that it would be as well to get all the preliminaries done with, and they could then arrange at their leisure whether he should give her his hand a week or two before Michaelmas term, or in the little Christmas vacation between it and Hillary. As to the strength of his case, he had not a doubt about it, but clearly saw his way to the verdict. Argued with the jury on substantial worldly grounds, the only grounds ever worth taking into account, it was a plain case, and had not a weak spot in it. He called himself for the plaintiff. There was no getting over his evidence. The counsel for the defendant threw up his brief, and the jury did not even turn to consider. After trying it, Stryver, C.J., was satisfied that no plainer case could be. Accordingly, Mr. Stryver inaugurated the long vacation with a formal proposal to take Miss Manette to Vauxhall Gardens, that failing, to Rainlaw. That unaccountably failing, too, it behooved him to present himself in Soho, and there declare his noble mind. Toward Soho, therefore, Mr. Stryver shouldered his way from the temple, while the bloom of the long vacation's infancy was still upon it. Anybody who had seen him projecting himself into Soho, while he was yet on St. Dunstan's side of Temple Bar, bursting in his full-blown way along the pavement, to the jostlement of all weaker people, might have seen how safe and strong he was. His way taking him past Telson's, and he both banking at Telson's and knowing Mr. Lorry as the intimate friend of the Manettes, it entered Mr. Stryver's mind to enter the bank and reveal to Mr. Lorry the brightness of the Soho horizon. So he pushed open the door with the weak rattle in his throat, stumbled down the two steps, got past the two ancient cashiers, and shouldered himself into the musty back closet where Mr. Lorry sat at great books ruled for figures, with perpendicular iron bars to his window, as if that were ruled for figures too, and everything under the clouds were a sum. Hello, said Mr. Stryver. How do you do? I hope you are well. It was Stryver's grand peculiarity that he always seemed too big for any place or space. He was so much too big for Telson's that old clerks in distant corners looked up with looks of remonstrance, as though he squeezed them against the wall. The house itself, magnificently reading the paper, quite in the far-off perspective, lowered, displeased, as if the Stryver head had been butted into its responsible waistcoat. 
The discreet Mr. Lorry said, in a sample tone of the voice he would recommend under the circumstances, "'How do you do, Mr. Stryver? How do you do, sir?' and shook hands. There was a peculiarity in his manner of shaking hands, always to be seen in any clerk at Tellson's, who shook hands with a customer when the house pervaded the air. He shook in a self-abnegating way, as one who shook for Tellson and company. "'Can I do anything for you, Mr. Stryver?' asked Mr. Lorry in his business character. "'Why, no, thank you. This is a private visit to yourself, Mr. Lorry. I have come for a private word.' "'Oh, indeed,' said Mr. Lorry, bending down his ear, while his eye strayed to the house afar off. "'I'm going,' said Mr. Stryver, leaning his arms confidentially on the desk, whereupon, although it was a large double one, there appeared to be not half-desk enough for him, "'I am going to make an offer of myself in marriage to your agreeable little friend, Miss Manette, Mr. Lorry.' "'Oh, dear me!' cried Mr. Lorry, rubbing his chin and looking at his visitor dubiously. "'Oh, dear me, sir,' repeated Stryver, drawing back. "'Oh, dear you, sir? What may your meaning be, Mr. Lorry?' "'My meaning,' answered the man of business, "'is, of course, friendly and appreciative, "'and that it does you the greatest credit, and, in short, "'my meaning is everything you could desire. "'But really, you know, Mr. Stryver,' "'Mr. Lorry paused and shook his head at him in the oddest manner, "'as if he were compelled against his will to add, internally, "'You know, there really is so much, too much of you.' "'Well,' said Stryver, slapping the desk with his contentious hand, "'opening his eyes wider and taking a long breath, "'if I understand you, Mr. Lorry, I'll be hanged.' "'Mr. Lorry adjusted his little wig at both ears as a means towards that end, "'and bit the feather of a pen. "'Dash it all, sir,' said Stryver, staring at him. "'Am I not eligible?' "'Oh, dear, yes, yes. Oh, yes, you're eligible,' said Mr. Lorry. "'If you say eligible, you are eligible.' "'Am I not prosperous?' asked Stryver. "'Oh, if you come to prosperous, you are prosperous,' said Mr. Lorry. "'And advancing?' "'Oh, if you come to advancing, you know,' said Mr. Lorry, "'delighted to be able to make another admission. "'Nobody can doubt that.' "'Then what on earth is your meaning, Mr. Lorry?' demanded Stryver, "'perceptively crestfallen. "'Well, I—' "'Where are you going there now?' asked Mr. Lorry. "'Straight,' said Stryver, with a plump of his fist on the desk. "'Then I think I wouldn't, if I was you.' "'Why?' said Stryver. "'Now I'll put you in a corner,' forensically shaking a forefinger at him. "'You are a man of business, and bound to have a reason. "'State your reason. Why wouldn't you go?' "'Because,' said Mr. Lorry, "'I wouldn't go on such an object without having some cause to believe that I should succeed.' "'Dash me!' cried Stryver. "'But this beats everything!' Mr. Lorry glanced at the distant house, and glanced at the angry Stryver. "'Here is a man of business, a man of years, a man of experience, in a bank,' said Stryver. "'And having summed up three leading reasons for complete success, he says there's no reason at all. Says it with his head on.' Mr. Stryver remarked upon the peculiarity, as if it would have been infinitely less remarkable if he had said it with his head off. When I speak of success, I speak of success with the young lady, and when I speak of causes and reasons to make success probable, I speak of causes and reasons that will tell as much with the young lady. The young lady, my good sir, said Mr. Lorry, mildly tapping the Stryver arm, the young lady, the young lady goes before all. Then you mean to tell me, Mr. Lorry, said Mr. Stryver, squaring his elbows, that it is your deliberate opinion that the young lady at present in question is a mincing fool? Not exactly so. I mean to tell you, Mr. Stryver, said Mr. Lorry, reddening, that I will hear no disrespectful word of that young lady from my lips, and that if I knew any man, which I hope I do not, whose taste was so coarse, and whose temper was so overbearing, that he could not restrain himself from speaking disrespectfully of that young lady at this desk, not even Telson's should prevent my giving him a piece of my mind." The necessity of being angry in a suppressed tone had put Mr. Stryver's blood vessels into a dangerous state when it was his turn to be angry. Mr. Lorry's veins, methodical as their courses could usually be, were in no better state now it was his turn. "'That is what I mean to tell you, sir,' said Mr. Lorry. "'Pray let there be no mistake about it.' Mr. Stryver sucked the end of a ruler for a little while, and then stood, hitting a tune out of his teeth with it, which probably gave him the toothache." He broke the awkward silence by saying, "'This is something new to me, Mr. Lorry.' 
You deliberately advise me not to go up to Soho and offer myself, myself, Striver of the King's Bench Bar? Do you ask me for my advice, Mr. Striver? Yes, I do. Very good. Then I give it, and you have repeated it correctly. And all I can say of it is, laughs Striver with a vexed laugh, that this, ha <laughs> beats everything, past, present, and to come. Now understand me, pursued Mr. Lorry. As a man of business, I am not justified in saying anything about this matter, for as a man of business, I know nothing of it. But as an old fellow, who has carried Miss Manette in his arms, who is the trusted friend of Miss Manette, and of her father too, and who has a great affection for them both, I have spoken. The confidence is not of my seeking, recollect. Now, you think I may not be right? Not I, said Stryver, whistling. I can't undertake to find third parties in common sense. I can only find it for myself. I suppose sense in certain quarters, you suppose mincing bread and butter nonsense. It's new to me, but you are right, I dare say. What I suppose, Mr. Stryver, I claim to characterize for myself. And understand me, sir, said Mr. Lorry, quickly flushing again. I will not, not even at Tellson's, have it characterized for me by any gentleman breathing. There, I beg your pardon, said Stryver. Granted. Thank you. Well, Mr. Stryver, I was about to say, it might be painful to you to find yourself mistaken. It might be painful to Dr. Manette to have the task of being explicit with you. It might be very painful to Miss Manette to have the task of being explicit with you. You know the terms upon which I have the honor and happiness to stand with the family. If you please, committing you in no way, representing you in no way, I will undertake to correct my advice by the exercise of a little new observation and judgment expressly brought to bear upon it. If you should then be dissatisfied with it, you can but test its soundness for yourself. If, on the other hand, you should be satisfied with it, and it should be what it now is, it may spare all sides what is best spared. What do you say? How long would you keep me in town? Oh, it's only a question of a few hours. I could go to Soho in the evening and come to your chambers afterwards. Then I say yes, said Stryver. I won't go up there now. I am not so hot upon it as that comes to. I say yes, and I shall expect you to look in tonight. Good morning. Then Mr. Stryver turned and burst out of the bank, causing such a concussion of air on his passage through, that to stand up against it, bowing behind the two counters, required the utmost remaining strength of the two ancient clerks. Those venerable and feeble persons were always seen by the public in the act of bowing, and were popularly believed, when they had bowed a customer out, still to keep on bowing in the empty office until they bowed another customer in. The barrister was keen enough to divine that the banker would not have gone so far in his expression of opinion on any less solid ground than moral certainty. Unprepared as he was for the large pill he had to swallow, he got it down. And now, said Mr. Stryver, shaking his forensic forefinger at the temple in general when it was down, my way out of this is to put you all in the wrong. It was a bit of the art of an old Bailey tactician, in which he found great relief. You shall not put me in the wrong, young lady, said Mr. Stryver. I'll do that for you. Accordingly, when Mr. Lorry called that night as late as ten o'clock, Mr. Stryver, among a quantity of books and papers littered out for the purpose, seemed to have nothing less in his mind than the subject of the morning. He even showed surprise when he saw Mr. Lorry, and was altogether in an absent and preoccupied state. Well, said that good-natured emissary, after a full half-hour of bootless attempts to bring him round to the question, I have been to Soho. To Soho, repeated Mr. Stryver coldly. Oh, to be sure, what am I thinking of? And I have no doubt, said Mr. Lorry, that I was right in the conversation we had. My opinion is confirmed, and I reiterate my advice. I assure you, returned Mr. Stryver in the friendliest way, that I am sorry for it on your account, and sorry for it on the poor father's account. I know this must always be a sore subject with the family. Let us say no more about it. I don't understand you, said Mr. Lorry. I dare say not, rejoined Stryver, nodding his head in a smoothing and final way. No matter, no matter. But it does matter, Mr. Lorry urged. No, it doesn't. I assure you it doesn't. Having supposed that there was sense where there is no sense, and a laudable ambition where there is not a laudable ambition, I am well out of my mistake, and no harm is done. 
young women have committed similar follies often before, and have repented them in poverty and obscurity often before. In an unselfish aspect, I am sorry that the thing is dropped, because it would have been a bad thing for me in a worldly point of view. In a selfish aspect, I am glad that the thing is dropped, because it would have been a bad thing for me in a worldly point of view. It is hardly necessary to say I could have gained nothing by it. There is no harm at all done. I have not proposed to the young lady, and between ourselves I am by no means certain, on reflection, that I ever should have committed myself to that extent. Mr. Lorry, you cannot control the mincing vanities and giddinesses of empty-headed girls. You must not expect to do it, or you will always be disappointed. Now, pray say no more about it. I tell you, I regret it on account of others, but I am satisfied on my own account. And I am really very much obliged to you for allowing me to sound you, and for giving me your advice. You know the young lady better than I do. You were right. It never would have done. Mr. Lorry was so taken aback that he looked quite stupidly at Mr. Stryver, shouldering him towards the door, with an appearance of showing generosity, forbearance, and good will on his erring head. "'Make the best of it, my dear sir,' said Stryver. "'Say no more about it. Thank you again for allowing me to sound you. Good night.' Mr. Lorry was out in the night before he knew where he was. Mr. Stryver was lying back on his sofa, winking at his ceiling. End of Book 2, Chapter 12